Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, welcome you here this evening to the regular meeting of the Town of Lincoln Council and ask you to stand for the national anthem. And tonight we have a, we have a very special anthem because it's um, sung by the students from 20 Valley. This evening we have all councillors in attendance with the exception of Councillor Foster, starting on my left, Deputy Mayor Paul McPherson, Councillor Diane Rajima, Councillor John Pachariva, and Councillor Wayne McMillan. To my right, Councillor Dave Thompson, Councillor Lynn Timmers, and Councillor Tony Brunet. On my left is Mr. Mike Kirkopoulos, our CAO. To my right, William Colossa, uh, the clerk of the town of Lincoln. <coughs> Councillors, are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Thompson? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going to be declaring an interest on uh, item 14C and item 16A as its uh, family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor, have you... Um, have you submitted your written document? Thank you. Councillors, um, any adjustments to the agenda? Councillor Njima. Pardon me, Madam Mayor. I just realized I have a, a interest to declare in um, the planning uh, minutes uh, my, uh, regarding the noise by lot exemption for Redstone Winery. My daughter has recently been uh, hired there as an employee. Okay, thank you very much. So noted. Have you submitted your <coughs> No, this news came out today. I didn't. I, <coughs> so. Thank you very much. I will send it in to William. Let's try the agenda again. Any adjustments to the agenda? There being none, we'll move forward. The next item on our, our agenda is a matter of civic recognition. Um, however, before I do that, I um, I must, because we have guests this evening, um, introduce the staff. Um, so I'm not going to, um, I'm going to start with uh, Chief Hudson, uh, if you wouldn't mind just standing up so that people can see you. And Deputy Chief Bill Blake is out here in the audience, thank you. And also Tamara Clark, who is our uh, training officer. Thank you. And in the Planning and Development uh, Department, we have Mr. Matt Bruder. Thank you, Matt. And in Public Works, Director Dave Graham. And Lee Reipenberg is in the, uh, the audience. It's our roads supervisor. Thank you very much, Lee. And Devin Walker. Lee, if you, or Devin, if you wouldn't mind standing up. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Devin's the supervisor of roads and fleet. Chris Collins, we have Chris who is our uh, bylaw officer, and Lisa McManus, legislative coordinator. So for those of you who, that, who have been here many times, some new faces, thank you very much. All right, civic recognition, Mike. 
introductions? Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. It's an honor um, that we're here this evening uh, in front of council uh, to recognize um, a number of our employees. Uh, you'll recall some time ago that uh, I shared some information with you on the Corporate Awards uh, for Excellence, which was a program that we had in place for some time, uh, but that went through a little bit of a metamorphosis, a little bit of a change as we brought it back. So this evening I want to recognize three groups. There's three categories uh, within uh, those awards, uh, and they are the CAO's Award of Excellence, the Customer Service and Spirit Award, and the Heroism Award. Uh, so I'll start with the CAO's Award of Excellence, and I will share a little bit of information about each of our uh, successful winners, uh, and then we'll ask them to come up, receive their certificate, uh, take a photo, uh, and then uh, there'll be an opportunity if they choose to say something. Uh, otherwise, if they don't, that's okay. I'm looking at Devin, who rarely wants to say anything, uh, who's in the crowd tonight. So I'm not going to put anybody on the spot like I usually do. Uh, so Devin Walker is our CAO's Award of Excellence winner. Uh, Devin is receiving this award for her outstanding performance as the Interim Roads and Fleet Supervisor from October 1st, 2016 to January 22nd, 2017. During her time as a supervisor, Devin went beyond just providing job duty coverage. She was responsible for identifying opportunities for continuous improvement by developing innovative processes to improve the town's winter maintenance operations, along with proactively leading staff training initiatives related to health and safety. Devin continuously demonstrated strong organizational planning and leadership skills during her time as an interim supervisor. And I can say personally, having uh, seen Devin in action, uh, if Devin tells you to do something, you better be doing it. Uh, and you better not ask a lot of questions. Uh, she knows a lot about what she's doing. Uh, she was nominated uh, by her team uh, and uh, she definitely deserves this award, I think, more than anyone for stepping up uh, during a very difficult time. So, uh, Devin, if you could come to the front. Our next um, award recipient is uh, Tamara Clark. Tamara is receiving our Customer Service and Spirit Award. Uh, Tamara joined the Lincoln Fire Rescue and Emergency Services team in July of 2016. Since joining the town, she has exhibited excellent customer service. Her positive attitude, combined with her kind, compassionate demeanor, lends to being an excellent team player. Tamara treats staff and the community with the same consistent approach. For this award specifically, Tamara assisted in a sensitive mental health issue related to fire hazard, along with internal staff and external agencies, including Niagara Regional Police and the Mental Health Society, to best assist this individual and their family. As a result, the family is now engaged in supporting this individual in their daily life, and the person is safe at home. Tamara was also recognized by the president of the Homeowners Association who had been dealing with resident concerns about this individual. Congratulations and well done, Tamara.
Absolutely. Thank you. No, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to everybody here, um, the CAO and the mayor and all the councilors, and also my chief, Greg Hudson, and my deputy chief, Bill Blake, and of course my husband, Brian Clark. Without all of you guys, I couldn't have got this very beautiful award. So thank you very much. And last but not least is our Heroism Award, and it's often tough to give this to one individual. Uh, so this year's recipient uh, is the entire Town of Lincoln Fire Rescue uh, and Emergency Services team. Uh, the entire service will be recognized for their contribution, uh, for their heroism, uh, and something that they display each and every day by responding to emergency calls. Uh, my sincere gratitude, and I think that of everyone in this room, goes out to the women, men and women of our fire service for, for putting themselves in harm's way uh, and sacrifice, sacrificing not only their lives, but also the time that they spend with their families to give back to our community. Without you and your families, we wouldn't be in the position to keep our community safe and prosperous. So today, while it's a chance to give you credit publicly, uh, every call and every day you are out there, you deserve our thanks. So tonight on behalf of the fire service, uh, we have Fire Chief Greg Hudson, Deputy Chief Bill Blake, Fire Prevention Officer Tamara Clark, District Chief Bob Blake, District Chief Dave Carricher, Captain Brian Cook, Captain Remco DeGraff, Captain Will McPherson, and Captain Chris Riddiger. Thank you, uh, Mayor Easton, members of council, Chief Krakopoulos. I just want to uh, gratefully accept this award on the behalf of the 118 men and women of Lincoln Fire Rescue and Emergency Services. And uh, I just, my hat's off to each and every one of them for their dedication and their, their selfless attitude and just their hard work each and every day. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kirkopoulos, for, um, for arranging and for following through on uh, the commitment that you made uh, to us about a year and a little bit ago to bring back the um, staff uh, recognition awards. And it's really good to see people stretching and uh, achieving more and more as the day go, uh, days go by. Councillors, we have the minutes of the Council of the Town of Lincoln regular session on June the 5th, 2017, and I have a motion moved by Councillor Timmers, seconded by Councillor Brunet, that the minutes of the May 1st, 2017 regular meeting of Council be adopted as circulated. Any errors or omissions? 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, the wrong date is on here. Just a moment, uh, just give us a moment. <clears throat> I'll read the motion again. <clears throat> that the minutes of the June 5th, 2017 regular meeting of council be adopted as circulated. Any errors or omissions? Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you, Mary Easton. Under um, councillor reports, the um, meeting with the executive director, it was the uh, YWCA, not the YMCA. Just a, a small correction there. Thank okay, you. Mr. Clerk. Thank you very much, councillor Timmers. <clears throat> Moved by Councillor Timmers, seconded by Councillor Brunet, that the minutes of the June 5th, 2017 regular meeting of Council be adopted as amended. Pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Councillors, is there any business arising from the minutes? There being none. We'll move on to item number eight. Uh, item 8A is the notice of motion, and I have a motion moved by Councillor Renjima and seconded by Councillor Brunet. Whereas the attempt to control, store, treat, and redirect the volume of stormwater and the attempt to control of the speed at which stormwater travels along our services takes considerable resources for the town of Lincoln. And whereas recent extreme weather events and record high water levels resulted in an emergency situation, unplanned expenses, and a reorganization of priorities to a focus on damage control and rehabilitation of some of the town of Lincoln's valuable assets, and also illustrated the damage that can result from rising water levels and rushing water. And whereas the more surfaces we have absorbing water, the slower the flow of water, and the slower the flow of water, the less erosion. And whereas the more surfaces we have absorbing water, the less expense managing, moving, and retaining water. And whereas the Town of Lincoln has several significant developments planned for the near future for which stormwater management has to be considered, now therefore be it resolved that staff come back to the appropriate committee with some urgency with these developments in mind, with options and cost benefit information for the use of proactive stormwater management measures, particularly the use of pre-absorption measures and materials such as permeable pavement. Councillor Renjima, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think the motion speaks for itself. It's, it's something that we've heard from uh, a, a sentiment around the council uh, table to to be proactive and look ahead to, and uh, generally and particularly with the damage that we saw uh, this spring with storm water. Councillors, questions to the motion? There being none, your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. This time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to um, spend a few minutes um, with my mayor's report and uh, also welcome those through Kojiko who will be watching us later this week. And I'm certain that if you are out and about in this great community of ours that you already know that our streets are being prepared for the July 1st celebrations in this special year of 150 years since Confederation, and also that the town is booming in terms of economic activity. Business is growing in Lincoln in many ways, and I attended two meetings, one hosted by MPP Sam Oosterhoff, where about 20 business owners attended and shared with us their challenges as small and large business owners. A number of the people in attendance were attempting to break through 
um, all of the barriers to open their first business. Some of the most challenging issues are the amount of red tape and overregulation and costs associated with starting a new business, the lack of space to locate a business, whether it's a new, um, a, a new spot where they would like to build or uh, in an existing building. There's a desire for new businesses to have trendy sandwich boards, they said, to advertise their new business. A larger business that wants to expand has difficulty finding enough people with the trade skills to support the specialized nature of their work. In other words, citizens are looking for ways to start their business, get their products to market. They need the right people with the right skills to fulfill their requirements, and that may require additional trade school opportunities, a subject that we will be discussing uh, with both secondary and um, the college um, um, Niagara College. I also attended the first Women in Niagara evening in Lincoln, where about 70 businesswomen gathered to discuss how to prepare themselves for the boardroom. And it was really done as an interview with a young woman who is quite skilled in this area. And they also discussed opportunities for women who are interested in preparing for the next municipal and provincial elections. In fact, there's quite a bit of support out there. And I also want to acknowledge both Devon and Tamara, our town employees, as being two strong women that are moving through their own professionals, uh, professional disciplines um, and having been chosen by their peers because they demonstrate the evolving leadership in the town of Lincoln. And I think we should all be pleased to see the equity in that. We also boast the most diverse economy in Lincoln which is exactly where we want to be in order to be strongly, a strong and sustainable community into the future. There are 835 businesses about in Lincoln, and that doesn't include all of our agricultural operations. And I think that's a number that will surprise many of you. The jobs fall largely into the healthcare, manufacturing, and agriculture fields. In an effort to develop future economic success for Lincoln, Council is seeking diversity and balance through an analysis of demographics we'll look at the age, which will look at the age of our residents, our incomes, and level of education. A more detailed examination of our labor force will focus on the working segment of our population, as well as an understanding of the industries that employ our residents and a breakdown of where our residents work outside of Lincoln and an economic base analysis which will tell us how our economy functions. And I want to remind you that although we don't have a great deal of manufacturing space in Lincoln, that any job that comes to the region of Niagara is good for Lincoln and good for our economy. I share this with you because a few months ago, Council debated the relative merits of hiring an economic development officer. And we did that earlier this year. And now it is essential to share with you what is in the works to develop the overall strategy for economic growth. And if you're free this Wednesday night, drop in here at the town hall at seven o'clock and hear committee of the whole, the entire council discuss the economic development strategy which has been developed by our economic development officer, Paul Diani. Lincoln is very fortunate to have the balance of residential and business growth available to us. Keeping our youth working in the town and encouraging business expansion as well as diversity and population all work together to improve investment. Much of our land is protected from development and that alone guarantees the quality of work and life in Lincoln as we enjoy it. I want to remind you again of $600,000 that came to the town of Lincoln within the last two weeks. And this was specific for the redevelopment of Conco Creek. Council with staff at the beginning of this um, budget year recommended that this project be given priority in 2017 pending the funding. And that came to us, it was shared between the um, federal and provincial governments 
And Conkle Creek supports our initiatives around active transportation, stormwater management, and also it lends itself to the completion and connecting of the surrounding parks and neighborhoods in the west part of town. On that note, and as I am always uh, want to remind you, you live in Lincoln where everyone strives to be a good neighbor and children are encouraged to achieve their very best. Through my time at the beginning of each meeting and other public engagements, I hope to send a message that lets our citizens know that Lincoln will be deliberately, that Lincoln will deliberately set itself apart by instilling consideration and a sense of achievement in our everyday lives. Each of you are part of those achievements. This is how we do it here. Many thanks for attending this evening and demonstrating your interest in local government. Thanks for opening your homes to us on behalf of council. There is no um, regional councillors report this evening. And we'll move on to council reports. And council, um, I would ask that in respect of time that council members please try to keep their reports and announcements focused to items and issues related to the Corporation of the Town of Lincoln and to items not already reported or announced previously this evening by your colleagues. Thank you. And we'll begin with Deputy Mayor Paul McPherson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I do have a quick report. Um, attended the uh, BIA monthly meeting last Thursday. We also had our economic development officer, Paul Diani, and our manager of bylaw and municipal enforcement services, Chris Collins, in attendance at that meeting. Um, it, it, it was also the uh, largest member uh, attendance to date, so it's uh, very encouraging that uh, we're starting to see more uh, of the BIA members coming out. <coughs> The focus of the meeting was uh, primarily on, <clears throat> excuse me, parking in the downtown uh, core, uh, a lively discussion around uh, parking enforcement and how we do that effectively um, from where we are today to a point where we are um, handing out tickets and how we, we go over that bridge and, and when. So we were engaging the uh, BIA members in that um, we also, uh, through uh, Mr. Deany, distributed the uh, parking strategy report that was delivered to committee back in December of 2016 and also uh, made mention of the uh, Buzel High School project and that uh, the, the parking strategy is, is in a hold pattern right now based on uh, what uh, will happen with, uh, with the Beamsville High School. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor McPherson. Councillor Njima. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> on June 8th, I attended on your behalf the Community Support Services of Niagara AGM. Uh, this is a group that does a lot of good work and I, I, uh, they used to help my mother when she lived alone, but uh, I, I, wasn't, I learned quite a bit while I was there that uh, they support seniors and adults with disabilities uh, in, in Niagara and help them live independently. They have three offices and one, the one in Beamsville is behind Albright Manor. They're provincially funded and they're also funded by client fees and some fundraising. They have 4,500 clients in Niagara. Uh, some of the services that they provide. Meals on Wheels. They provide Meals on Wheels hot and frozen to people all around Niagara. And there's a picture in here of you last year uh, delivering meals to people. They provide transportation, uh, congregate dining, volunteer visits on phone and in person, home maintenance and repair, homemaking, and safety at home assistance. Uh, volunteer Services Director Carrie Lynn S Jones or Sones, sorry, I'm not sure, I, I can't read my own handwriting, is making her way to local municipalities and I believe she'll be coming here in the fall to tell us more about what they're up to. Uh, okay, uh, on June 7th, I was invited to attend Great Lakes High School's entrepreneurship class and sit on a panel with two other dragons. 
to decide whether I wanted to invest in any of their business startup ideas. It was a lot of fun. And we didn't actually invest any of our money, although some of the ideas were actually very interesting and intriguing. We ended up deciding to invest in two, and uh, one of them we decided not to invest in. And I can't tell you what it's all about. It's highly classified, top secret stuff. But, uh, June 13th, I attended uh, Councillor Pachariva and uh, Councillor uh, McPherson's ward meeting. Brunei, right, I apologize, that, right, I was there. That's right, so I'll let them talk about that. June 16th was Friday morning, and I attended the, uh, an information session put on by the Niagara District Council of Women with Beamsville resident Dr. Gordon Edwards and he was speaking about the plans already in place to ship 23,000 liters of nuclear waste through Canada from Chalk River to a U.S. Department of Energy site in Savannah River, South Carolina over an eight-year period. Councillor Timmers and Regional Councillor Hodgson were there as well and Councillor Dave Cadwell from Grimsby. This is not new information. It's been in the paper and at Regional Council. Regional Councillor Bill Hodgson has been vocal on the issue and supportive of the movement to create awareness and stop what they are saying is an unnecessary practice. Mayor Easton has been vocal on the issue and has kept, up, kept us updated and Dean Allison has made moves as well. Liquid nuclear waste, we are told, has never in the history of nuclear power generation been transported across land by truck. Solid form, yes, but never liquid. This is new and we're told there was already one shipment in April. And we don't know if it came through Niagara or what route was taken. Nuclear waste and radioactive material will outlast the many reactors closed and planned for closure by thousands of years and must all be discarded somehow. The speaker went into considerable detail for over an hour about nuclear power generation, the resulting waste, the composition of it, the containment of it, the type of trucks and containers, the makeup of the containment cask, etc. He showed us a picture of the kind of trucks he said they'll be using. The cab and container are separated by what looks to be about 15 feet so as not to expose the driver. We are told that the liquid contains at the very least three dozen radioactive materials, not just urinal liquid nitrate. We're also told that a mere one liter of this liquid could contaminate a reservoir, a reservoir the size of Georgetown Reservoir to 300 times the ma maximum permissible exposure. That's one liter, and each of these trucks will contain close to 100 liters. The question was asked, what can we do? Seek a court injunction? The opinion was that political power and the power of the people is the best route. For example, in 2013, the Bruce nuclear plant shelved plans to ship 16 radioactive steam generations to Sweden after opposition, and I believe the Provincial, the Provincial Council of Women was strongly involved in that opposition. And this was after permission was given from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. We don't know what routes the truck will take. Classified information, they may not come through Niagara, we were told. We don't know, but they may. Of concern too, and I'm sure our fire chief is as well versed as he possibly can be on this, is that our local first responders may not be allowed on scene in the case of an accident or a spill. The risks seem considerable. That was my take. It was scary, of course. It was a fascinating presentation. Key in my mind is that this apparently is not even necessary. Chalk River has been routinely solidifying the waste on site via a process called downblending up until 2012 but now has this contract to ship it to the U.S. Hats off to the Niagara District Council of Women for their work on this. We are paying attention. Um, there is a letter that they've, a form letter if anybody's interested to send it off and, and oppose this. Um, um, I think I'll ask at a future committee um, for information from our fire chief about where we stand on that. You can bring that up under council inquiries. Good, I will. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Pachariva. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, as Councillor Majima mentioned, uh, Councillor Brunet and myself hosted our Ward 2 open forum last Tuesday night at uh, St. Mark's School. Uh, we had approximately 40 to 50 people in attendance, uh, residents of Ward 2. We targeted um, 1,000 
residents in the Stettelbauer and um, Ashby Drive neighborhoods to come out to this. Um, our focuses were um, the 2008 budget planning. Uh, we had a, a little bit on the Lincoln Transit pilot project. Um, Parks master plan and our principles that surround that. And then the, um, the two design concepts for Angelina Prokic Park. So design A um, had a um, soccer pitch and a junior and a senior playground and um, uh, it's a, a water feature, a water, I'm drawing a blank, a splash pad. Thank you, thank you, counselor. And then um, concept number two, or concept number, not, not two, concept number B um, had uh, tennis courts and um, a multi-purpose court and the junior and senior playgrounds and there was a, um, a three meter wide walkway that circumvents the entire property. It's a 10 acre park. Um, there's five points of entry and we asked the public, we said, what do you think? And what concepts would you like to see? Um, and got some, got some very, very good uh, dialogue that night. Um, I know I had been contacted by probably a dozen residents. The really good thing, and I want to thank um, Shannon McKay and Carrie Beatty, um, worked with Councillor Brené and myself to actually, we had a PowerPoint presentation. So we used that as our focal point, went through it for the first hour, and then we opened it up to, to questions. So it was fantastic. So I've already shared that PowerPoint with numerous residents and asked them to then circulate to their network because People were busy and, and said they couldn't come. And then we had a ranking of those elements. And we asked the public to say, what would you like to see? And then we'll come back with, a, with another concept. Good. Excellent. I guess that means there's only one more word for a board meeting, right? No I pressure, of course. Councillor McMillan. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. A week ago, Friday. Um, I spent some time with a lot of residents in the town. We all gathered at um, the Fleming Center. We were going to be part of the, the uh, Canada 150 mosaic. We spent some time uh, painting our tiles and uh, it was really a, 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 a very emotional time for everyone there knowing that what they were doing was going to be part of the history of the town. And uh, we got the we got the tiles all finished and uh, le left them with the um, with the coordinator. It's all going to be put together to be hung in the town hall. We're looking forward to the uh, official <coughs> unveiling, which will be on Friday, June the 30th, from mm -hmm. four to six here at town hall. It was a, a really a good day and, and a, a lot of real good in interaction with among, um, amongst all the people who were there. Um, and. Uh, people of all ages as well. And they all had a great time being part of the history of the town. <coughs> Thank you. The mosaic, of course, is a Canada-wide project. And the yes. um, design is all done on a, on a flat car. And uh, so when they're all put together, we will be, Lincoln will be number 68, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, Last Monday, I was at uh, NPEI board meeting. Um, Wednesday following, uh, had a meeting with uh, our Town of Lincoln Economic Development Officer, Paul Deany, Councillor Timmers, and uh, Chris Ray, Manager of Municipal Relations and Stakeholder Relations for Enbridge Gas, and four other Enbridge Gas uh, managers with regards to coming up with some practical solutions to business expansion hurdles, specifically in the greenhouse industry, uh, and new uh, expansion of natural gas lines supporting the uh, horticultural uh, side of things in the town. And I gotta say that uh, I was pleased to see um, a very good tone and a very agreeable uh, outcome. We're waiting for the final results, but certainly they were uh, willing to sit down and have a good conversation with us. Um, and then on Friday, I attended on behalf of the mayor um, the 55th uh, anniversary of Homes by Hendrix. Um, and uh, wow, I just gotta say, there was a lot of people there. And uh, I'm just so proud that they're part of our, uh, our business community here in Lincoln for 55 years. That's a heck of a milestone and uh, 
I wish them 55 more. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you, Mary Easton. I will not speak in too much detail because a lot of the things have been covered off already that I attended as well. I was going to speak regarding the Canada mural mosaic as uh, Councillor McMillan has already spoken about it, but I just wanted to add a little bit of detail. It's 150 <laughs> communities that are painting these murals across the, whole, the entire country, and um, I was very proud to be part of it. There were 320 people that came out and painted uh, tiles, and our mural consists of 576, so the balance of those were made up by professional artists that pull this whole uh, designed together and we had a sneak peek of the finished product and it's just absolutely fabulous and the stories behind the tiles are endless i love to hear the stories. so when we do the unveiling here we'll be able to uh i'm sure everyone can share with us their tile and the meaning behind it and why they painted what they painted so it was a fabulous event and that was our um our uh, second cornerstone of um the canada 150 committee so um, also I wanted to, oh, the other thing we did at Canada 150 is we finalized our um, Tulip in Bloom contest. So we judged all the photos, there were many, many that came in, all different categories, so we've chosen the four top winners. That's all secret at this point, but um, the winners will be uh, presented at the Canada Day uh, celebration at Charles Daly. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brunet. Uh, thank you, Mary Easton. Out of uh, respect for your original comments about doubling up, uh, I won't go into talking about uh, our ward meeting per se, but uh, you know, we, we, we talk about these ward meetings and the effectiveness and the amount of people come out, and uh, as Councillor Patrick said, we had about 40, but I just want to take the time to read three comments we've received from a number of residents since the ward meeting, uh, and this certainly speaks volume to uh, what we heard that evening. Um, the first one, we certainly appreciate your efforts to have an open forum with, with the ward as it sends a message that you want to hear from us about our concerns. The second one, I wanted to extend my gratitude for all the information and the work completed to date during the public meeting last night. I am a resident that hopes for a park that will set the precedent moving forward. And the third one was, we wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, along with other representatives from the town of Lincoln, for making the planning and construction of Angelina Prokich Park a priority. We have, been, we have been anxiously awaiting a common space for our children and ourselves to enjoy since we started building our home in 2003. Thank you for taking into consideration the ideas and the needs of the residents of this rapidly growing community to meet the requests of a diverse demographic that would be utilizing this incredible space. We truly believe that this park could be iconic by including spaces that appeal to many people, children's, children, teens, adults, and seniors. One of the takeaways that uh, when those people left, uh, um, both Shannon and Maria uh, invited uh, people as they were leaving to come up uh, to the front table and grab um, copies for their neighbors. So our, our certainly intention is we're gonna get multiple uh, um, plans uh, scanned back and we're, we're hoping we're probably gonna get upwards of 200. So it was, it was an excellent meeting, thank you. That's excellent, thank you very much. And um, the clerk is reminding me, it's not too late, ladies and gentlemen, to provide park input and just go to the town website and um, you can do that until June 26th. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, councillors, for your commitment, for your attention to detail in terms of what's going on in the town, for engaging with the public. It's all appreciated, no question. <clears throat> The next item on the agenda is delegations, and we do have a delegation tonight. I think everybody's all dried out now after they came through the barrage of rain. Um, Mr. Um, Sandy Nunziata, Regional um, Councillor and Chair of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Please come forward, Sandy, and is Michael coming with you? And do you need a chair for Mark? Sure, yes. <clears throat> We'll, um, the, clerk will, um, we'll cl the clerk will look after that. <clears throat> uh, Councillors and um, those of you who are watching um, on Pojico, um, 
When um, Councillor uh, Annunziata was elected the chair of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, I contacted him a few days later and asked him to come and speak to the council because we have so much uh, green space, so much wetland, so much um, wonderful um, area that needs to be preserved, but also um, that people need to enjoy. Um, and we need to know more about what the Conservation Authority has uh, planned. And so, of course, he, he agreed tonight, and he's here this evening with, um, with Michael Rays, the um, communi communications officer of the Conservation Authority, and also the um, manager. Mark Brickle, is that your correct title, Mark? Acting CAO. The Acting CAO. Thank you. So we're very pleased to have you here tonight. And um, Sandy has a little slide deck that he's going to show us. But he also, he didn't come here for the free ride. He knows that there might be a few questions on what's happening just in terms of governance and those kinds of things, and that's appropriate. So he's all ready for that too. And, uh, and so, councillors, I would ask um, just to remind you that um, it's not a debate, okay? There'll be no debating. And um, make sure that you're, um, you're welcome to ask questions and um, just direct them through the chair. Uh, thank you very much. So we're looking forward to the story because things are moving and we don't want people in Lincoln to get sidetracked. We wanna just keep moving on with the plans that you have uh, in mind. And Mike and I met with uh, Michael and um, Sandy a few weeks ago and uh, I think we've, you know, with the number of projects that we've got going on here, including Prudhams and the need to uh, make sure that our waterfront is well protected, we have plenty on our agenda to keep uh, focused. So welcome and uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Madam Sandy. Mayor, for having me first off. And uh, um, it's an honor to present to Lincoln Council. Um, to my right, uh, Michael Reels, uh, our communication specialist. And to my left, Mark Brickle, uh, our interim CAO. We have an incredible, incredible staff at, uh, at the MPCA, and I just really wanted to highlight this. Tonight is Mark's 25th wedding anniversary. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping he's not gonna be in the doghouse when he, when he, when he, when he gets home, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Mark, for uh, prioritizing this meeting and certainly uh, helping with this presentation, so thank you. Um, we'll start off with uh, our, our slide presentation. Uh, basically who we are. Uh, now the watershed geographically is made up of 2,424 square kilometers and all of Niagara is within that watershed. 21% of it is uh, the city of Hamilton and 25% uh, of Haldeman County. Now when you talk about apportionment and how we achieve our, um, our levy, basically it's a portion between those three uh, contributing municipalities. So the board of directors is made up of 12 members from Niagara, two members from Hamilton, and one member from Haldeman. And again, it's uh, representative of the amount of geographic area in our watershed. Uh, presently, we have 38 conservation areas, over 7,200 acres. In March of 2014, we added 15 acres of lakefront property in Waynefleet. We're going through that exercise right now. Uh, ultimately, when we look at uh, these fantastic properties in Waynefleet, we want to make sure that we're connecting with our partners and certainly uh, member Jeffs and uh, um, her, her council have been excellent stewards of that process. Uh, so we're listening to hear the feedback from the residents of that community. Those residents are going to pass on what they want to see um, happen at these particular properties. They are going to receive the mandate um, from council and then we as a conservation authority are going to look at what the residents of Waynefleet want and we're certainly going to do whatever we can to uh, help uh, achieve that goal. Um, in May 2014, we added 24 acres in the expansion of Balls Falls Conservation Area. And uh, Balls Falls is one of our premier properties and I encourage anyone to go out there and, and uh, just uh, experience some of the festivals that we have uh, on a yearly basis and certainly it's become a hot spot for uh, uh, wedding um, receptions as well. 
Um, in uh, September 2014, we added St. John's Center from the Jackman Foundation, and presently we have a land acquisition program, a uh, $500,000 contribution from Niagara and a $100,000 uh, contribution from Hamilton. So what we do, uh, watershed management, uh, construction permit approvals, development reviews, water quality programs, restoration programs, infrastructure programs, and source water protection. Uh, now I made comments when I first took over the chair that we have uh, an infinite amount of work to do with such a finite, um, w w with a finite budget. Uh, and as provincial legislators keep heaping more and more on conservation authorities, we have to stay nimble and certainly we have to make sure that we respect our mandate but see where we can lend a hand and certainly lend resources. Uh, that's always been a challenge, especially when you look at the budget uh, and uh, levy apportionment. But I will say this, um, over the course of the last three years, uh, roughly a 1.5% uh, levy increase. Uh, last year was a 0% levy increase, and this year uh, we're under 1% uh, again uh, for the levy increase. Operations. Project management, uh, 38 conservation areas, uh, recreation programs, and certainly education programs. Corporate services perspective, communications, marketing and community relations, geographical information services, accounting, human resources, and administration. Uh, so let's talk about the STRAT plan. Now the strategic plan was uh, something that we entered into, and uh, of course it predates my time on the board and certainly my time as an elected official, uh, but the strategic plan was started in 2013, roughly 2014. Uh, and the strategic plan from 2014 to 17 is just about to expire. We're about 95 to 96 to 97 percent complete uh, as far as hitting those targets and hitting those goals. Uh, so we're just about to embark on the next strategic plan moving forward. Uh, so the MPC Board of Directors retained performance concepts to, to facilitate the process and plan development. Uh, there was extensive public consultation, stakeholder meetings and staff meetings. Uh, strategic plan steering committee then formed five subcommittees, governance and accountability, policies and priorities, improving development process and performance, effective communication, and stakeholders and public asset management. So the process that we undertook uh, roughly three, four years ago is not uh, dissimilar from what the province just did uh, over the course of the last two years with respect to updating the language in the Conservation Authorities Act. Uh, bill 139 did come through and you can see that it's an omnibus bill and it includes uh, certainly a lot of elements but there are uh, elements within the Conservation Authorities Act that they're looking to update and, uh, and, and certainly review. So not unlike the incredible public consultation that the province undertook, I think it was the Hempson uh, Consulting Group, we did the same thing back in 2014. Uh, we developed a draft strategic plan based on recommendations forwarded by the five subcommittees. And again, it's important to make sure that we engage all our sector partners, uh, whether it's uh, the Home Builders Association, whether it's the environmental uh, associations, whether it's the conservation groups, whether it's our agricultural and farmer groups. These are the subcommittees that we put together to make sure that their voices are heard when we develop the strat plan moving forward. Uh, again, uh, the strategic plan process, we conducted public consultations on the draft strategic plan. The MPCA steering committee then considered the public consultations and developed a final draft. And that final draft was presented to the MPCA board of directors. Uh, the public was invited in order to create another opportunity for comment. Uh, so again, we saturated um, the process with public consultation. We wanted to make sure that we got this right moving forward. Um, now, when we talk about the mission of the NPCA, it's to manage our watershed's natural resources by balancing environmental, community, and economic needs. Um, again, depending on um, what sector um, you're passionate about, sometimes that mission statement is, um, is a little controversial. But again, I think when you look at all the sector partners that we represent, it is vital. It is vital that we listen to all those partners' voices and we balance the needs uh, within our watershed. The vision, balancing conservation and sustainable development for future generations by engaging landowners, stakeholders, and communities through collaboration. Um, our values, a sustainable balance between environmental conservation, uh, economic growth, and agricultural prosperity. Uh, clear and respectful communication, integrity, fairness, and sensitivity to all impacted by our actions and decisions, transparency, accountability, and quality of services, pragmatic solution-oriented approaches to decision-making, a respectful work environment, and professional development. Uh, so moving forward, we're very 
proud of the successes that we've had. Uh, and when you look at the metrics and the data that came out um, of the strategic plan and where we are right now, um, you know, we put together these great graphs and when you look at trends in park operations, you can see that back in 2014, um, expenses far uh, outweighed revenues. And again, our first priority is always uh, conservation and making sure that we are good stewards of our properties and certainly our watershed. That's our first priority. But again, within our own context and with our own properties, if there's an opportunity, if there's an opportunity to make them uh, self-funding, to make them more sustainable, we're going to look at those opportunities. And certainly that's just being conscientious stewards of taxpayer dollars and certainly respecting um, not always going to the taxpayer to fund some of these operations. So these are user fees and uh, uh, certainly when you look at the success that we've had at some of the properties, they're absolutely beautiful. I have all the respect and confidence in the world and our staff that they do such an amazing job mo um, um, monitoring and maintaining these properties and, and they really are jewels within Niagara. So when you look at the MPC self-generated funds, and again, they include user fees, sales, admissions, administration fees, and interest, you can see that there's a gentle trend upwards, and that's exactly what we want to look. Basically, the goal is to take the, the pressures off of the taxpayer and the levy system and try to be more self-sustaining, and that's exactly what we've, what we've done. Um, this is a great statistic here, and it's just the trends in volunteers, and we have an incredible um, group of volunteers that are always uh, on our properties, um, investing their time, energy, and resources in some of our programs. And you can see the trend. Uh, we were below 200 volunteers in 2014. Uh, we just celebrated a, a volunteer appreciation night, and it was packed. And I was so proud to hand out awards and, and recognize our incredible volunteers because you can see that we're well over 700. It's the highest level of volunteerism that we've ever had at the MPCA. I think it's a testament to the great work that our staff does, uh, the incredible stewardship that our board has provided, and certainly... Um, uh, our, our volunteers that really believe and are passionate about our watershed and certainly uh, some of the green spaces in Niagara. Uh, so all the credit goes, in, uh, goes to them and, and certainly their commitment and their volunteerism. So let's talk a little bit about Bill 139. I touched on it earlier. Uh, it was a two-year consultation process with public and stakeholders. Um, and again, they broke down the sector representation um, when they tried to get that feedback. And um, uh, the Hempson report is available online and you can see how uh, the sector breakout uh, occurred. And it's not unlike anything that we did with our strategic plan. Uh, agricultural community, environmental groups, uh, municipal planners, municipal staff, uh, landowners associations. So again, broad representation um, by any group that may be affected by our policies. That was critical. Uh, several amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act under key themes, strengthening oversight and accountability, increasing clarity and consistency in programs and services, increasing clarity and consistency in regulatory requirements, improving collaboration and, engage and engagement, and modernizing funding mechanisms. Again, we are operating from 1992 dollars. Uh, there has been zero increase from the provincial government when it comes to uh, conservation authorities. And just to give you an idea of the roughly 12 million dollars that the MPCA takes in with respect to its levy, uh, roughly three to four percent of that comes from the provincial government. The rest comes from Niagara, Hamilton, and Haldeman taxpayers. Uh, so key changes, uh, board meetings open to the public. And again, this is going to be mandated with respect to uh, Bill 139. Uh, the MPCA already conducts its meetings publicly. As a matter of fact, we were the first conservation authority, and I think the only conservation authority right now out of the 36 conservation authorities in Ontario that actually live streams its meetings. Uh, in, the, in the process of being open and accountable, we thought that was important. Again, not everyone can make a 1030 meeting and be there, so we wanted to make sure that uh, we engage the public the best way that we can. Uh, all our board meetings are live streamed. Established an advisory board. Uh, the NPCA Community Liaison Advisory Committee established in 2014. So again, Bill 139 mandates that CLACs or Community Liaison Advisory Committees are part of uh, conservation authorities. The NPCA was the first one to actually have a community, <coughs> excuse me, a Community Liaison Advisory Committee. 
Um, I think there are only two right now. So out of the 36 conservation authorities, there are only two. Uh, with community liaison advisory committees, the MPCA being one of them. Again, it is important to engage our sector partners. So our community liaison advisory committees are made up of our sector partners. I was absolutely thrilled last month uh, to through all our reach out meetings and uh, we've conducted close to 40 to 50 stakeholder meetings with various groups, whether it's the conservation groups, whether it's landowners, whether it's indigenous, um, um, native and Métis, uh, whether it's area planners, um, and just recently, we changed our terms of reference to invite Métis Nation to have a seat at our table, which is an incredible accomplishment, something I'm very, very proud of. Um, required to make bylaws public, again, uh, through board regulations one through three, and they are available online, we do make all our uh, bylaws public. Um, MOUs with municipalities to be made public. Uh, and again, when I took over the chair, the first thing I did, I asked for any MOUs that we actually have with our lower tier partners um, and understanding that we follow uh, legislation, whether it's the Conservation Authorities Act, uh, whether it's other provincial legislation. I know with respect to provincially significant wetlands, there are no less than 18 instruments, 18 provincial instruments touch provincially significant wetlands that we, um, that, that we adhere to. Uh, so what we're trying to do is create fidelity with respect to all these legislative instruments. Um, the MOUs were created to um, make sure that any natural heritage feature uh, was properly assessed and the impact was uh, very well known with respect to the planning uh, issue. So through MOU, the NPCA is actually the commenting agency on any natural heritage feature um, that a lower tier municipality through their planning staff has and um, we, 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 we comment on those, on those features. Again, uh, we're in the process of hopefully renegotiating one. Um, I understand that the MOU that we presently have has been expired for quite some time, but it just keeps rolling over. We're hoping to adopt new language and certainly more stronger and effective language within the MOUs moving forward. And again, we will make sure that that document is public. Um, one of my first uh, orders of business as chair was to make sure that I got a copy of that MOU. Uh, as you know, the living landscape is a policy document that the MPCA has put out most recently. Uh, first thing I did, I made sure that I circulated that wide spread to all our uh, host municipalities and all planning staff at all um, our municipalities have a copy of that right now and hopefully they'll be commenting on it very shortly. Required fee policy and fee schedule. Uh, again, the policy, uh, um, the fee policy has to be formalized by the NPCA. So when you look at all the things that we're already doing with respect to Bill 139, this is the one thing that we will be working towards, formalizing a policy, but the fee schedule we already have and it has been published since 2015. Uh, these are important uh, aspects of the Bill 139, and this is something that the MPCA has been actively advocating for. So through the two-year public consultation process, um, I believe it was the region of Niagara uh, and uh, the town of Fort Erie. I think those were the only two municipalities that commented during the two-year comment commenting period. Uh, and one of the things that we commented on at the MPCA was the ability to have a stop work order. And basically, this is a very important uh, issue. We do not want to be a um, enforcement agency. We are a commenting agency, but at times when we know that um, certain landowners are doing things that they're not supposed to be doing with regulated features, unfortunately we get dragged into it as an enforcement agency. At that time it would be great if we had the ability to have those stop work orders issued immediately. And what it's going to do is going to save hundreds if not thousands of dollars to the landowner to stop working, stop doing what he's doing immediately um, and hopefully save him costs down the road if there's enforcement action and he actually has to undo the works that he's done or he has to pay an incredible fine. So it's an important element that we do with respect to enforcement but again it's not something that we want to do, it's not something that we're uh, um, uh, you, you know really uh, um, passionate about. What we want to do is make sure that uh, people are following the rules and certainly we are regulators um, and that's exactly what uh, role, role we want to do. Again, maximum fines have increased from 50,000 for individuals to uh, 50,000 for individuals and 1 million for corporations. So again, um, now there is a bit of an incentive to make sure that people are following the rules. And hearings for stop work orders. Again, oversight by minister to review appeals. Uh, one thing that we did ask for that uh, we was not included in Bill 139 uh, was the ability to educate uh, JPs. Uh, and when certain infractions occur and 
there's an appeal decision going forward, sometimes the, the JPs just um, aren't in tune or educated enough with respect to Environmental or Conservation Authority Act, um, and they rule a little bit differently than they would. So that's one thing that we were hoping for, but um, maybe down the road. And having said that, I will leave it up to questions or comments from, uh, from Council. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Through you, I just have a couple of quick questions. First of all, thank you for coming in and sharing with us the uh, your presentation. Um, we'd like to see you more. So certainly, uh, you know, keeping up to date on what's going on is a great thing for I, us. I was just here. We uh, we were trying to solve an issue with one of uh, your uh, your your farmers. Uh, um, Mr. Dick, and he's an incre been an incredible partner, and uh, we're, we were just here actually earlier on uh, having a meeting. So yeah, this is my third time here in uh, I think two weeks. That's very good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, with regards to the, the living landscape uh, document, certainly, I mean, it came through our, our planning committee last, uh, last planning meeting, and uh, it's 161 pages. Um, and I did have some concerns, and my concerns are, are solely around the, the length of time that was put forward for commenting from the public uh, going from May 16th to June, June 1st, um, and the ability for our, our planning committee, uh, planning uh, department, to actually make comment to a deadline of the, the June 30th deadline that you guys set forward. And I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts on extending that um, in order that we get, you know, have a, a be able to have a fulsome conversation about it and. Great, great, great question, and uh, so uh, very direct, yes. So um, as the chair, I will be moving that motion at our earliest board meeting, which is on the 28th, and I'll be extending the commenting period to late September. Um, I'm hoping that gives all planning departments an opportunity to uh, fully grasp what the living landscape is about and provide those comments. Again, those same comments we heard back from some of our partners. Um, the time frame, um, I don't think it was uh, um, anything that you know, we wanted to fast track. We want to hear the comments, uh, so we will be pushing that uh, that deadline for responses back to late uh, late late September. So I hope that answers your question. That's that's very good. Thank you very much. Um, one more quick one: Are there any future plans for the, uh, the Jordan Harbor site uh, that's been uh, sort of recently sort of? <laughs> um, yeah, we did enter into an MOU with um, Niagara Sustainability Initiative, and they were going to be doing some fundraising and some works on those lands. Um, sorry, Mark, did you have some clarification on that? I see you kind of jumped up there. So, <laughs> yeah, we certainly we never finalized that MOU. We do have a, a, a new um, agreement on that property now with um, uh, the rowing, uh, the rowing school. Niagara Rowing School. Um, really excited. Um, uh, John Murphy's heading it up, and uh, I think he's going to do a phenomenal job with that. Beyond that, uh, uh, it is the next property that we actually are looking to master plan. So we would see that coming on in the next year to two years at the most uh, to actually do a master plan. Obviously, we see great opportunities to connect uh, uh, with the properties across the, the highway and want to look for ways to connect with that side of the uh, um, uh, to the north side of the QEW as well. Great, thank you very much. That's that's great to hear. Looking forward to see what you guys come forward with. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Easton. Uh, through you to the delegation, uh, again, we thank you again uh, for coming. Um, so two questions. Um, at our recent infrastructure meeting last week, um, it was... Uh, it was pretty well taken up by uh, a report that we received on emergency flooding. Okay. Um, <clears throat> needless to say, Lake Ontario is up approximately five feet. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, erosion, uh, a lot of our roads in, in Lincoln and, and wastewater flooding. So we're looking at um, a considerable um, deficit in terms of repairs. And, uh, you know, obviously we have, we have staff engaged uh, in some short-term and intermediate and long-term strategies on how we're going to approach this. Um, so I guess my first question uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to the delegation, um, you know, obviously we're, we're, you know, we're looking at, uh, you, you know, the municipal disaster recovery program, but we're asking uh, our staff, um, and I know through our CAO and, and through our director of public works, you know, we really feel that we need to come up with a long-term strategy yes. with 
you know, not only you guys, not only the NPCA, but uh, you know the uh, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources. So. Um, you know, we need to discuss, you know, some of these long-term solutions. So, you know, we're very hopeful um, as a council and certainly as chair of infrastructure and, and, and working with our CEO that, you know, that we can work with you and get, you know, get to the table to work in collaboration to look at some of those long-term strategies. So um, I'm just wondering if you could, if you could make, maybe make a comment on that particular subject. Yep. Uh, so all great comments, Councillor, and thank you for bringing that forward. Uh, so if you include uh, the conference call that we had, that's four. That's four times that we've actually been engaged uh, with, with the Town of Lincoln. And um, uh, to your CEO's credit, he, he did bring that issue forward. And uh, we convened a special meeting with uh, all our skill set and, uh, and staff around the table to see how we could lend resources and how we could help uh, with this particular uh, process. Um, I do believe that uh, S Steve Miller did get back uh, with respect to a contact at uh, MNRF um, just to see what funding opportunities are available. Ultimately moving forward, I've committed, uh, certainly as the chair of the MPCA, that we are going to do everything we can to help our, our, our partner municipalities. Um, understanding that our mandate is hydrology, the effects of water um, and how it impacts um, um, soil erosion and uh, uh, slope stability and all these issues that people are dealing with on a regular basis with increased uh, levels uh, in Lake Ontario and even on Lake Erie. So again, whatever we can do to lend resources and knowledge and skill set, uh, you have our commitment uh, with respect to funding dollars. Absolutely, I think you're on the right track by um, tackling the province and the federal government uh, when it comes to um, great uh, Great Lakes shorelines. That's their mandate. Um, certainly anything upstream, if we can help, um, we're, we're going to be there to support our partners. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Annunziato. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, S second question. Um, um, so, you know, appreciate your, uh, your presentation and just a couple of um, takeaways that I had written in preparation for this, you know, from your vision statement, uh, engaging landowners, stakeholders, and community uh, through collaboration. So with that statement in mind and with the value uh, statement in terms of transparency, accountability, uh, quality of services, and then a respectful work environment. Um, you know, as the new board chair, uh, taking over from uh, past chair Tim's, yes. um, you know, needless to say, I think there's an opportunity here for you on behalf of the MPCA, the authority to turn over a new page and, 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 and develop, um, you know, a, a, new, a new opportunity for an understanding. Um, so, you know, you touched on it, you know, in terms of making your MOU, MOUs public yes. uh, since you've come on as the chair, but uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'm just wondering if uh, uh, Chair Nunziato could really just kind of give us a brief overview on, on your approach on how you think you can turn that page and really, um, you know, show the public um, that you are uh, committed to, to a change of the MPCA. Uh, absolutely. First off, like, uh, as I started my preamble, we have an incredible board. We have an incredible board that's highly committed, and anyone that understands how the MPCA works understands it's, it's a huge time commitment. So I respect and value all the opinions and certainly um, uh, the skill set that all our board brings to the table. We have an incredible staff that works tirelessly to make sure that we're open and transparent and we're answering questions and doing everything that we can, um, not necessarily to say no, but to say how can we help you. Um, that's the first thing that I wanted to impose, certainly at the MPCA, is that we're, we're, we're there to help. Um, in whatever capacity that we can, we're going to make sure that we're there for our partners. Um, this is going to be a watershed year for the MPCA. And as you say, turning over a new page and, and, and moving on from one strategic plan on to another strategic plan, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we will have a new CAO at the helm. Um, we will uh, be engaging our next uh, four-year strategic plan moving forward. Um, I've already made the commitment that we are going to make sure that we engage all our stakeholders and all our sector partners and listen to their voices. We are a listening authority. Uh, we're not, uh, and e even the word authority is a, is a bit of, you know, um, a, a bit of a misnomer. Um, so that's my commitment, and I made that commitment as soon as I took over the chair in January, that we're going to listen and we're not going to let one voice um, hijack the process. We are going to make sure that all our sector representatives have a voice at the table, and, and that's my commitment to this council, and certainly my commitment to all the all the residents within the watershed. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a, a lot of commitments that the province has put on our plates. Um, understanding what our mandate is and how we can effectively um, um, 
you know, maneuver through the legislative framework, that's always going to be a challenge. Uh, and sometimes democracy is messy. And sometimes people aren't always going to agree with the conservation authority. And sometimes um, we're going to get into disagreements. But as long as we respectfully disagree, um, I think um, I think that's democracy in action. So my, my approach, I don't think it's any different from your approach, Councillor. And you want to do what's in the best interest of your constituents and you want to be open and transparent about it uh, and you want to be respectful and show an incredible amount of honesty and integrity. That's how I approach my role as the chair and uh, I make sure that my board follows suit and certainly we, we at the MPC from a staff perspective, uh, they understand that mandate very well. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate those comments, and I'm sure you've found out already in short order there's a lot of people that will hold your feet to the fire. Absolutely. Thank yes. you for coming tonight. Yes. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Pachariba. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, thanks for coming tonight. And just a question, and I don't know whether there's been any resolution to it. Um, the City Hamilton, a couple, a year or so ago, appealed either their assessment or disputed their contribution to the NPC. Has there been any resolution to that? Because kind of it tweaked, Sandy, when you mentioned about the the contributions going forward for acquisitions. Is, mm -hmm. Has that anything happened in that field? Well, and again, great, great question, JD, and thank you for bringing that forward. So ultimately, in this small little preamble, and I'll try to be as quickly as uh, as possible. Understanding that there's three contributing uh, partners to our levy. Um, and there's two ways to apportion that levy. Uh, one is through a tri-party agreement between the City of Hamilton, the Region of Niagara, and the Region of Haldeman. And the other way is through a provincial formula, which they call the default model in the event that you can't reach agreement. So the City of Hamilton was operating on, um, and for all intents and purposes, all of us were operating on a tri-party agreement. But understanding the incredible growth that was going on in the Hamilton region, uh, in Binbrook, and understanding that their assessment values were going through the roof, um, was it still appropriate that they were paying the exact same amount a decade ago that they were still paying now? We wanted to see that agreement just to see if there was an opportunity to re-engage them. And again, I think it was started on behalf of um, financial stewardship on behalf of our taxpayers in Niagara. We wanted to make sure that Niagara residents were paying their fair share, and certainly Hamilton residents and Haldeman residents were paying their fair share. When we did that investigative work, there was no agreement. There was no history of an agreement. There was no written agreement. No one could find the agreement. So understanding that it just rolled over maybe through word of mouth or through an informal handshake, there was no agreement. So when we brought this up to our partners in Hamilton, uh, needless to say that they were a little taken aback that they didn't want to um, pay any extra. They, they were very comfortable paying their, their small share. Um, we initiated conversation with them to have a new agreement put in place. They didn't want anything to do with that process. Uh, so unfortunately, we had no, uh, no choice but to revert to the default model presented by the province. Um, that's where we're at right now. Understanding that we are a levying body, so when we go to our partners to say this is the amount of money that we're levying your municipality, there really is no uh, time for debate. Uh, a partner can't just say, no, we're not paying it. There is a mechanism, and uh, that's through appeal. So begrudgingly, they've been paying us the provincial formula that we have, but they've been appealing it behind the scenes. So uh, I'm grateful to say that that process wrapped up uh, roughly two weeks ago um, at um, uh, Commissioner of Lands and Mines, uh, and um, we are awaiting a verdict on the appeal process. Uh, we're very confident that um, on behalf of the residents of Niagara, who we believe have been overpaying for quite some time now, that um, a resolution is going to um, be appropriate and it is going to benefit the residents of Niagara. Certainly there's going to be Hamilton um, councillors and Hamilton residents that aren't going to be too happy that their share has been increased. But again, it's all about fairness, it's all about equity, and um, I don't know if you can sense that uh, the City of Hamilton uh, isn't too happy with the MPCA, um, that's part of the reason why. But again, if we could have that agreement in place, absolutely we'd sit at the table and we've tried to do that, uh, but unfortunately they kind of like uh, the old way that they were doing things. That's it, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, I would echo uh, Councillor Thompson's um, comments about the MPCA and how important it is to Lincoln. You know, I sat in uh, CAO Mike Krakopoulos' office last week, and he, and he showed us a map of the town, and he, and he threw up the green belt, 
and then you threw up the MPCA lands, and there was not much left. Very constrained. NEC. Right? Of, of yeah. NEC. 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 Yes. NEC. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to build a, a strong relationship with you. Totally. I do have a, a question around the strategy, and I just found it interesting. Maybe I'm just naive in, in, uh, in the timing of your strategy. And, you know, you're setting a strategy for basically the next term of council uh, or the next, the, the next elected officials. Is that, is that a normal uh, practice to, to set it a year before the election and then for those uh, folks to take it over and run with it? Great questions. Um, ultimately, we have a lot going on with Bill 139 coming out with new language, um, with our strategic plan just finishing, and understanding that there's going to be a, a long gap between the next provincial election. Um, so again, I wasn't part of the previous strategic plan. Um, I was elected uh, and first took office in uh, January of 2015. The strategic plan had already been uh, finalized and, uh, and ratified at that point. So I think it is uh, part of the practice that once you finish one strategic plan, um, you, you move on to the next. And again, it, it, it's not necessarily um, the will of the board uh, or um, the will of staff to formulate what the strategic plan is. That's what the public consultation is all about. And the public is going to bring forward their ideas and their vision. And uh, we're going to engage our sector partners who have the skill set and the knowledge um, from, from their particular area of expertise and how they're going to be impacted by the Conservation Authorities Act and by the MPCA. And they're going to bring that voice to the table. I don't necessarily think uh, um, it, it matters not who the board is at that time, um, as long as we get great engagement and we get an incredible amount of public input, I think the process is going to be um, very well received. Thank you, Councillor. I have a few questions, um, Chair Nunziata, uh, and I'm asking these questions because, um, because we have Coach Co here and I think it's a good idea for some of the governance issues to have um, to be um, made more public. So I want to ask you a question about um, the membership and why there are so many politicians. That's a great question. And um, I, I always defer to the province. Um, so if the province would like to put specific language as far as how conservation authorities are, um, are, are populated, how those boards are populated, then by all means we're going to follow those, uh, those rules and regulations. Um, currently right now the NPCA as a board and certainly as a staff, we have no say. We have no say in how those uh, conservation authority boards are populated. But I do know this, we have an incredible board with an incredible mix of skill set and knowledge. Uh, we have uh, three citizen appointees, um, two from Hamilton and one right from here from Niagara. Uh, we have environmental uh, engineers on, on the board. We have an incredible skill set. Now, understanding that was one of the questions asked during the two-year process of the Conservation Authorities Act review was governance. And um, I can honestly say that the comments were put together and everyone, from what I understand, reading the, the consultants' reports, is very comfortable with the governance model as it stands right now. Uh, whether individuals would want more, um, more politicians on a Conservation Authority board or not, that's not for me to decide. Um, I work within the framework that we have. Uh, the legislation is, is, is very clear, uh, and uh, Bill 139 just came out saying that the governance um, is suitable. Um, I know AMO came out with a position on it as well, uh, AMO representing 420 municipalities, and um, you know their ideas were the governance is acceptable. And I know at some point um, there are conservation authorities throughout Ontario that have moved towards uh, having elected officials on their board, and I think it has something to do with... Um, uh, taxation with representation, ultimately understanding that the Conservation Authority is a levying body. Um, so there has to be a level of accountability to the taxpayer every time the Conservation Authority Board goes to uh, a levying partner and says, this is our budget, um, you know, these are the funds we need. Understanding that there's no right of refusal uh, for, the, for, for that uh, particular partner to say no. Um, I do believe that's an important element, and maybe that's why uh, you see the trend going towards more politicians. But again, I work with what I have. Um, if the legislation uh, came out um, tomorrow that suggested that there should be an equal balance, there should be citizen appointees, citizen representation, then that's something I would fully accept as well. Again, we have no say at the MPCA. 
we are dealt with the language and uh, we follow the language the best that we can. Very good, thank you for your clarification. You and I have had um, a number of discussions about the whole uh, area of mandate creep. Yes. <clears throat> and we know that the province has ultimate accountability, but they certainly haven't been shy about downloading responsibilities. And quite often these responsibilities are not well known by the community at large and in some cases people absolutely disagree with them. Yeah. Um, so can you, would you uh, just elaborate a little bit on that so that the public who are observing can understand and so that we as a council can better understand? Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, I wanna be very specific. Um, part of the conversation that we've had, that you and I have had in the past, is around personal interpretation yeah. of the regulations. And we often see this with other agencies where the individual who is inter doing the interpretation has their own spin that they want to put on it. Right. And four or five years later, you've got a whole different flavor. These, certainly this kind of interpretation hasn't been, inter hasn't been uh, well received by the community. Do you have a plan for avoiding this? You know, what, what is your comment on that? Well, that's a great question. And again, that's something I'm passionate about is certainly the policy creep and understanding what our mandate is, uh, what the legislative instruments we have at our disposal um, and how effectively we, we, we put those into practice. Um, you know, I, I made the comment earlier, uh, Your Worship, that uh, there's no less than 18 provincial instruments that regulate uh, provincially significant wetlands. That's a lot of bureaucracy, that's a lot of red tape. And um, if you're the average homeowner or a developer that, that needs to uh, you know, find the path of least resistance in order to manage the system, it's very cumbersome. And when we talk about providing opportunity and, and an open for business sign for Niagara, um, that's part of the conversation that we should definitely be having. Um, but to your point of policy creep, yes. Um, there has been interpretation beyond what the mandate is. There has been interpretation beyond what the legislation is. And I think that's normal, that's inherent uh, when you have such a dedicated, passionate staff working at a conservation authority. Um, unfortunately, um, their interpretation um, you know, maybe comes from a, a place of ideology or academia rather than what the language in, in, in the legislative acts say. Um, so again, it's something that we have to be mindful of um, and we have a great staff and uh, once we have a new CAO in place, I'm sure that that message is gonna trickle down through, through, um, through, through all our staff at the NPCA. Um, but again, I think it's all about creating that fidelity between all these policy statements. And um, uh, Councilor McPherson made a great uh, point about when you do the overlay uh, between NEC and MPCA and uh, any other natural heritage feature, it, it really um, provides a whole lot of constrained area um, which impacts a community's ability to grow uh, in a very sustainable way. Now we're passionate. We're passionate about our green spaces. We're passionate about our conservation areas. And we know that those areas are a huge draw and that's a benefit. Uh, for Niagara and that's how we're going to attract investment and development uh, because these are incredible places that that people want to experience but we also understand that there's a balance and uh, unfortunately we haven't just seen um, the partnership that we had hoped from our provincial partners in understanding some of the challenges that we have in Niagara so I'll give you a great example um, you know, I always refer back to provincially significant wetlands and we are blessed here in Niagara with, um, well, with a vast amount of PSWs. Uh, we're technically not even a, a peninsula, we're an isthmus uh, here in Niagara, but we're surrounded by two great lakes in the Niagara River and um, uh, it just forms a great natural watershed. Uh, but we do have landowners um, that have properties duly zoned and uh, a record of lot uh, that they've gone through the proper channels and. Um, Everything has been done according to uh, you know, statutory requirements and they've invested an incredible amount of money and they're hoping either for a legacy for their children or to develop it later on. And uh, they've had these properties for 20, 30 years sometimes, uh, all zoned appropriately. And then in 2006, the province came in with an overlay and said, that's a PSW and unfortunately it sterilized a whole lot of land. Uh, I know being from Fort Erie, I know we were impacted quite a bit from it. And I get calls on a regular basis. And I was sitting right where you were uh, back in 
2006 to 2010, hating the NPCA, literally, uh, because of all the calls I was getting uh, about how could they do this to me? Uh, you know, property owners in tears. Um, what do you mean it's a PSW? What do you mean I can't develop it? And what do you mean I was gonna build my home there? Um, so there's a lot of stories out there like that. Um, and unfortunately, the NPCA has become kind of a lightning rod. And I really try to emphasize this to people. We're gonna do a much better job of trying to communicate this. We are not an environmental protection agency. Um, we abide by the Conservation Authorities Act. And everyone wants to you know, think that we should be responsible for every tree and um, every species at risk and uh, every element with respect to the environment. And that's just not what we are and that's just not what we do we respond to hydrology and the surface and, and the effects of surface water and how it affects erosion and, sh and soil stability. Um, that's, that's our mandate, hydrology. So again, when you talk about the policy creep, I think we have to do a much better job of conveying that to the general public that we are not an environmental protection agency. And a lot of people look to us and say, well, yeah, but you have the word conservation in your name, so isn't just it natural and appropriate that you should be protecting this or you should be protecting that? Um, and, and I like to say that, yeah, we do those things within our mandate and within our own properties, but we're not gonna trample on the private rights of landowners. Um, they have a right to do certain things on their property, and as long as they understand their responsibility and understand um, their obligation to be good stewards of the land, then we really you know, don't wanna involve in ourselves in, in those issues. Uh, so we wanna take a step back uh, certainly as a conservation authority and really respect our mandate and that's what we're trying to do and we're trying to convince people and uh, educate people on that aspect as well and we, we certainly had a conversation um, you and Michael and um, the CAO and myself on the whole matter of the NPCA being um, uh, very loyal um, uh, to the pre-planning process that we have here at the town of Lincoln which um, I believe is what assists our um, landowners with um, um, making sure that they're exposed to the most correct information when they come forward with an idea um, so that they don't end up spending money that uh, un unnecessarily and uh, possibly ending up in court. Yeah. My final question, and I feel this is quite important since we did see the living landscape document uh, about a week ago, is what you're and my question is really, what are your plans to educate um, both on the, the living landscape as well as the coordinated review um, to ensure that we, we have a well-informed public so that we don't end up with um, misunderstanding and um, a lot of uh, hardship along the way? Uh, great questions, Your Worship. And um, again, I'm a firm believer of that one window concept, which you're advocating right now in the planning department. Uh, I think it's huge to get all the partners at the table and making sure that under, everyone understands what their responsibilities and obligations are. Um, I think in the past there was a lot of miscommunication and misinterpretation and a lot of finger pointing uh, where um, you know, town planning staff would say, well, this is the MPCA, and the MPCA would point the finger right back and say, no, no, this is town planning staff, or now you add a third element, which is the region, now you have upper tier government, lower tier government, and um, uh, an and authority like the MPCA, and everyone seemed at odds. The one window approach is huge, and I think to your point, it, so, it saves um, not only time and energy and resources, but um, it, 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 it saves a lot of negative feelings that are going out into the community. Um, so we can do a better job of making sure that planning departments, um, conservation authority, uh, upper and lower tier are both speaking the same language. Uh, and I'll give you a great example. Uh, so um, Mark will appreciate this. I was at uh, the Waynefleet open house and we were engaging everyone in this public session about uh, possibilities for um, the Wayne Fleet waterfront uh, on our properties. And the minute that we mentioned the word development, uh, you know, the light bulb went off in a lot of people's heads and they equated development with high rise condos and, and, uh, and, and you know, bricks and mortar construction. So I, I, I said, there's gotta be a better way because when we <laughs> refer to that situation of development, it could be a passive trail. Um, it could be um, um, a very innocuous um, 
you know, cobblestone pathway to keep people out of the more ecological sensitive areas, but keep them on one path. That could be development. But there's a misconnection um, when people don't understand the terminology and we're, we're speaking in different languages and it's almost like the Tower of Babel. Um, literally, we're all, we, we've all been speaking different languages and it's being interpreted a whole lot different uh, than, than, than what we mean it to be, what, what area planners mean it to be, and certainly what the residents uh, mean it to be. Um, so it's funny, we had uh, the first conversation with um, our consultant moving forward with the strategic plan and I told him, I said, y you have to be able to articulate what the word development means in those situations. Um, we have to be speaking with the same language and, and only then can we really get true buy-in and um, understand effectively what the conservation authority does and uh, hopefully, you know, all of our municipal partners can be advocates and, and, um, and, and certainly we'll send them off into the world and, and, and educate them the best that we can. But we've made a commitment. We're, we're going to try to do a much better job of communicating what our position is and what our mandate is and, 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 and the pathway that we're going to follow. So, and if we haven't done that in the past, we have my commitment. We're going to try to do a whole lot better job at communicating those things uh, to the general public. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to hear about very deliberate plans that you, that you will have in place uh, so that the public can come forward and review those documents. Because certainly the glossary of terms within the living landscape is very, very comprehensive. I went through that very carefully to, to a answer the one question around what does development mean in this context? Yes, yes. Thank you, and I want to congratulate you on the action that you've taken to include the Métis Nation, and, um, and so that's another way um, that uh, you're bringing balance to the process. Thank well, you. Well, we hope that the, um, we heard that the controversy is finding another route. Um, here we have a lot of business to conduct. Good. And, um, and some of our business does involve um, residential development, but it also involves the development of the waterfront in a way that's going to protect it. And we don't have time for distractions. So our commitment to you is that we come to you as a willing partner, and um, if, we ha if there are understandings that are required, we are willing to participate in those. If we have questions, we know who to find to answer those questions. And I believe that um, it will be a much more positive um, time going forward. All right, well, I appreciate your time and thank you uh, to council for your questions. And again, um, any questions, comments, pick up the phone. Uh, I'll make myself available. I know Mark as interim CEO, uh, he's always there to help and uh, any questions or concerns by all means just pick up the phone and call us so thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much for your time much appreciated thank you councillors for your participation um, we move on now to correspondence I have a motion moved by councillor Pachariva and seconded by councillor McMillan that correspondence from the 20 Valley Tourism Association TVTA dated June 13th 2017 regarding the wine garden at the 2017 Sunset Music Series at Charles Daly Park be received, and that the Council of the Town of Lincoln hereby authorizes the TVTA to serve alcohol at the 2017 Sunset Music Series taking place at Charles Daly Park in accordance with the Town of Lincoln's Charles Daly Park Rental Agreement terms and conditions and the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario's special occasion permit requirements and that the Council of the Town of Lincoln declares the said Sunset Music Series to be held on Tuesday nights from July 4th to August 29th, 2017 as municipally significant in accordance with the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario's special occasion permits permissions, provisions. Questions to the motion, Councillor McMillan. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a, a minor point. Uh, in the letter that, that came from uh, Ms. Smith, um, she refers to, in, in the last paragraph, please find below a list of the participating wineries. When it is not the wineries that she's listed, she's listed the musicians. Whether that's so uh, critical or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, or Mr. CAO, what, uh, what, what would your um, opinion be? Uh, three, Madam Mayor, uh, not a significant uh, issue. 
Um, I think what they're trying to do is identify the dates on which the events will be occurring. Um, and as to the licensing, it will be dealt with through the Alcohol and Gaming Commission. So not a significant issue. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Councillor Pachariba. Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Um, it, the first paragraph um, states the wine gardens on a pilot basis this year. Is there something that's changed? Is the dimensions of it changed, or is this just a, a simple type over with, uh, you know, Councillor McMillan caught that without removing some of the some of the words. And I guess my second question would be, you know, concerning the whole special events bylaw and, and the you know the uh, timelines for a special occasion permit, um, you know, requiring 30 days notice. Oh, why? Mr. Yeah, why this is kind of coming two weeks? I, I believe that the CEO has clarified this for us a couple of times, so okay. I'm going to ask him to do it again. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, um, I, I think it's actually an oversight specifically on the pilot basis piece. I think that was something that was captured, um, you know, looking at just the previous version of this particular letter. I know both Councillor Timmers and I sit on that particular uh, board, uh, and it's been, uh, it was never discussed as a pilot basis. I think it's something that they've always had at that location in terms of having the, the wine available. Uh, as it relates to the uh, the timeline for and the time frame, I think as the mayor highlighted, I have um, clarified that I think sometimes um, within our special events uh, byline, our special events policy framework, uh, the timelines that are put in there are for staff to process sorts of things. Um, you know, like we have that 60 day window, we have those other things uh, and to inform those around us, they're, they're more meant, um, you know, for processing time than they are as uh, methods to either say no uh, or to uh, decline this particular thing uh, and this particular request. I can say specifically on the special events policy, uh, it was referred back to staff. We hope to come forward uh, next month with a revised policy. Uh, Acting Director Bruder, uh, Mr. Deanne and I, as well as our legal counsel, Mr. Halinski, met with the board uh, and met with representatives of the board uh, and beyond the board, those that were part of the pilot project, or those were that were part of the initial consultation uh, when this came forward back in 2015. And we hope to have a much more streamlined uh, policy before council uh, in the coming weeks. Satisfactory, Councillor? Satisfactory. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Any other questions or clarifications? Your pleasure on the motion? The motion is carried. We move on to the Sport and Recreation Culture Committee minutes of June 7th. I have a motion moved by Councillor Pachariva, seconded by Councillor Njima, that the minutes of the Sport, Recreation and Culture Committee meeting of June 7th, 2017 be adopted and the recommendations contained therein be approved and acted upon. Councillor Njima. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It was a pretty quick meeting. Uh, we had a uh, delegation, Mr. Martin Poos, at the beginning, um, he was speaking about uh, an idea of his to sort of bridge the the gap between, uh, well, to provide uh, transit for for lower income uh, people in the community in Niagara, and through this, through his proposal, his idea. Uh, He's proposing to provide uh, scooters and bicycles to people on a rental basis, on a monthly basis, I think he was saying, and he's proposing that the, that the uh, proceeds, a certain amount of the proceeds from that rental arrangement go toward uh, purchasing uh, affordable housing, building affordable housing for people, and that they, uh, they, um, they live in that affordable housing on a rent to own kind of basis. So uh, in interesting, interesting idea and he's going to be going around to other municipalities and talking about that. Um, he, and he, it was suggested that he have a look at our active transportation committee and perhaps talk to Niagara Regional Housing a little further on the, uh, on the idea. Uh, then we had our next delegation was from the municipal, our municipal heritage committee regarding their, uh, the considerable amount of work that they've done uh, over the last year to come up with a design and strategy for their plaques to go on the, uh, I think there's, uh, well, all the upcoming um, proposed uh, designated properties in Lincoln. And also they have a, des a design also, not just for the uh, marking the properties 
and naming the properties on the plaque, but also a design for an interpretive plaque that would provide information about the history of the property and why it's designated. So they told us about that, and then there was a subsequent report on that as well. And then we had uh, a report regarding the designation of uh, Beamsville District Secondary School, the building. Uh, the original wing uh, was in 1917, and subsequent to that, there was an addition built in 1924, and the proposal is that uh, both of those uh, parts of the school be uh, designated under the heritage process. The timing is very good as this is the 100th anniversary of the construction of the first wing, 1917. The one with the beautiful columns in the front. Also there's a time capsule, time capsule uh, uh, somewhere on the building, on the front of the building, and the proposal is that that be opened in conjunction with the designation ceremony and celebration. Uh, and the timing of that will, will be clear in I'm sure, and I think we're talking about the fall, but again, detail on that is, is coming. We had uh, the Municipal Heritage Committee minutes of April, and then the Canada 150 minutes of April 20th came forward. And that was the meeting. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, councillors, any questions to the report? Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. <clears throat> and next we have the uh, motion moved by Councillor Njima and seconded by Councillor McPherson that the minutes of the public meeting of June 12, 2017 be received for information. The pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. And a motion moved by Councillor McPherson and seconded by Councillor Rinjima that the minutes of the Planning Committee meeting of June the 12th, 2017, including the confidential addendum thereto be adopted and the recommendations contained therein be approved and acted upon. Um, Councillor, um, Councillor McPherson, thank you. Councillor McMillan? Yes, uh, I would like to request, Madam Mayor, that uh, report PL 1742 be lifted from the minutes and acted upon separately. PL 17? Yes, it is the application for the noise exemption requested by Redstone Winery. All right, um, councillors, <clears throat> we need a motion to um, to lift. Um, I'll consider your your request as the motion. We need a seconder, councillor Timmers. I have a motion moved by Councillor McMillan, seconded by Councillor Timmers, that PL 17-42 be lifted to be dealt with separately. Your pleasure on the motion. The motion's carried. And then following um, the uh, disposition of this, uh, of this motion, uh, then we'll, um, we'll carry on with the, with the minutes. Uh, and Mr. Clerk, I will need clarification on who's uh, doing, um, who's going to be dealing with the report this evening. 
for you, Madam Mayor. Um, with that motion, uh, with that report being lifted to be dealt with separately, um, I'm just in the midst of preparing the motion that resulted from the consideration of that report, which Council will have the ability to debate uh, in, its, in, its ex in its current form, uh, at which point in time a decision will be made on that motion, following which you will return to the minutes to deal with the remainder of the, uh, of the, of the discussions, deliberations of committee. So right now um, you're dealing with PL 17-42 and perhaps the uh, vice chair of the committee could speak to that matter just to brief council on its del on committee's deliberations at which point in time uh, I'll have the motion prepared very good councillor okay thank you madam mayor um, just looking forward in my uh, notes It's on page, um, page 19. Uh, committee heard several delegations re uh, respecting a noise exemption request by Redstone Winery, both in favor and in opposition. Committee later approved the noise exemption request subject to conditions. That is the summary for uh, the noise exemption part of the uh, planning meeting. All right, um, Mr. C, uh, Mr. CAO, do you have any comment? Uh, through, you, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, just to uh, maybe for the public record highlight what those particular exemptions were that were approved. Uh, A is that the event organizer shall notify all neighboring properties within 500 meters uh, of the entire property boundary in writing a minimum of 10 days in advance of the start date of the event, a copy of the written notice shall be provided to the town, that the above notification shall provide the neighboring property owners with a direct telephone number to call during the event, should the neighbors experience any noise complaints, C, that the event organizer shall respond to and take appropriate corrective action to make any, to any noise complaints to minimize any disturbances from the event, and D, if the town's required to respond to any noise complaints, that the event organizer will be responsible for payment of the town's noise complaint inspection fee. I think one of the other items that we added was that we would have one of our bylaw officers attend each and every event that occurred to monitor noise. We also, at that meeting, had our manager of bylaw services, Mr. Chris Collings, who is in attendance this evening, speak to his staff's observations at the most recent, uh, at that particular time, the most recent event that had occurred that evening and assess based on that, uh, what his interpretation and their interpretation was of whether there was noise uh, and uh, staff answered a number of questions, uh, as you can see, uh, related to the various elements that were contained within the report, uh, focused on the planning and development pieces of it, uh, the economic development pieces of it, uh, as well as some comments that I had made, once again, highlighting uh, what the 60-day submission timeline is intended for. Uh, and uh, if council has any questions, uh, Mr. Bruder, Mr. Collings, myself, uh, Mr. Danny, others that were instrumental in writing the report uh, can address any of those. I'm going to um, first ask um, Councillor McMillan what his um, what he had in mind uh, when he uh, when he requested that um, this report be lifted. Councillor McMillan. Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. This, uh, I'm, I'm opposed to the passing of this motion. Um, I, I really don't like the idea of a blanket approval for uh, the whole series of concerts that are planned by the Redstone. There are 25 concerts being planned for the uh, summer months and even into the fall through June, July, August, September, and October. I think that um, the number of concerts that they have planned is excessive. Um, and I also believe that at these concerts and because of the uh, because of the number of the concerts and because of the evening hours and the extension of the evening hours, it be they become highly intrusive into the neighborhood that surrounds the winery. And I believe also that 
the owners of the Redstone Winery, they must respect the comments and feelings of their, of their neighbors, and certainly that has not been shown in the past. And I, even with the uh, conditions that have been put forward in the motion, um, certainly they are well, mitigated in some respect, but I don't think that that's going to have an effect that is going to, uh, going to please the neighborhood and also um, um, restrict the, the amount of noise that it will be created by all of, this, um, all of these concerts during the summer. The um, June to October, it just means that the citizens are going to be inundated for the whole summer long, and I think that is far too intrusive. So I would not support the motion. Thank you very much, Councillor. <clears throat> Any other comments? Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you, Maryson. I actually did not support that motion that night simply because it's not that I don't support Redstone and it is their business, but when you look at the list, it is the entire summer and it is every Tuesday night. Um, they had spoken about the summer concert series being maybe one performer, but if you look at the second list of dates, and I counted them, I think there's 19 or 20 dates, it's every Tuesday for the entire summer. And it says in large print, band. So are we looking at a full band performance every single Tuesday for the entire summer till October? from six till 10, I think it is intrusive and I, I do support and I think they should be able to have some events, but I think 25 is excessive and that's why I did not support that motion. I think the people that live within that area are really going to um, be affected by this ongoing every Tuesday night, every Thursday night, and it says Wednesdays, and it says Saturdays. Like it, it just seems like an awfully lot of events, so that's why I did not support the motion. All right, um, anyone else? Councillor Pachariva? Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Um, just a question with, with respect to the, the four bullet points there on, on how we're going to monitor that. Um, do they differ in any way, shape or form with what we did last year? Probably a question of Mr. Kirkopoulos. And then maybe a, a follow-up question to Mr. Bruder. You know, it's, it's saying that um, they're going to take efforts to mitigate with the use of acoustical curtains and trees planted around the stage. So have those trees been planted because you know, this this arose last year, and um, I see Mr. Breen in the in the audience, and we were we were uh, you know on speed dial, and and got his calls, and you know went down a couple times myself to check it out, and you know, the group needs to show some um, respect for the neighborhood and 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 address those issues. Like, you know, we identified them last year. As if the trees haven't been planted up until now. Okay, let's, yeah, so just let's, let's get s some more facts okay. here. Certainly um, your question will be answered uh, first. Um, Mr. CAO, have the, have the curtains been installed? Have the trees been planted? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, those two items have occurred, both the acoustical curtain uh, and the uh, trees were planted. Okay, the second part of your question, I'll pass over to Mr. Bruder, and, and I'm going to broaden it with your permission, because uh, Mr. Bruder, we need, um, we need to go back to the policies that are directing this activity. And if you could clarify what those are and whether there are limitations in the activity, because this is a value-added activity that is found in our official plan. Is there anything further that you would add in terms of a policy direction and limitations? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in terms of the, the policy here, um, so the, the noise bylaw, um, uh, the threshold for noise and perhaps Mr. Collings can help me out. Um, 9 p.m. is the threshold. However, there is um, a requirement too that prior to that, that noise levels be um, at a volume that doesn't disturb um, 
adjacent residents. Um, in terms of what we're developing for policy to address issues like these, um, we'll probably be, we will be looking at um, revising the noise bylaw in the future to make it more comprehensive. Um, I'm going to defer the rest to Mr. Collings to address your question in further detail. Mr. Collings, would you, um, it, you can come and sit at this table if you don't mind. And Mr. Collings, um, at the last planning meeting, we also had, um, I believe there was some evidence, I use that word loosely, but there was some commentary on compliance to the existing policy and um, visits that had been made and uh, maybe you could just review those for all of council. Is this on? Yes, sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, so you to uh, the council. Uh, the visits by bylaw enforcement uh, back on the Friday, the concert was ongoing. Uh, the evidence from the bylaw officer was that the sound was minimal. Um, I, I do take that into comparison uh, from the public's comments that they believe that that was a representative evening of concerns they had. I can only bring to you that the evidence I had from the officers was that it was minimal. That was the description. Um, we were responding uh, right after the complaint was received. The officers were on site at the complainant's address. They then verified that information at Redstone's winery. Um, if in the future that information changes or the observations are different from the officer, different measures may be taken. I just. I can only express to you what the evidence was, and the officer stated that noise was minimal. Um, that That's the best description I can give at this point. To, uh, to describe the policies in regards to um, value added with Lincoln, um, I may ask for further clarif clarification on your question, just to maybe better understand how I can address um, the noise bylaw and the policies as it pertains to value added in Lincoln. I'm, I, I agree with a value-added part of agriculture and a winery wanting to have concerts, but if there's anything more I can address with the, the way an exemption is reviewed and approved based on that policy, maybe I, I just better understand your question. Very good. Mr. Bruder, would you please elaborate for uh, your colleague? Uh, certainly, Madam Mayor. So in terms of, of value-added, um, our official plan policies speak to supporting agritourism-related um, initiatives that are both directly and indirectly related to agriculture um, with respect to this particular concert series. Um, this would be tied into the winery operation and promoting business for the winery, providing an event that's attractive to tourists um, that, uh, that we want to attract to the area. So with respect to uh, this area of official plan policy, um, which is in our agricultural section of it, um, it's, it certainly is in line with promoting that agritourism related piece. Um, it's, it's also a good way um, in terms of value retention for the winery just to ensure that, um, you know, it's, it's another um, attraction that generates, um, generates patrons to the facility. All right, thank, um, does that um, clarify Mr. Mr. Collings? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, so in, and maybe to uh, bring to council's attention the, post, the process of reviewing a noise exemption um, as bylaw manager, um, I, re I just received the dates, looked at the times and dates of the events, and um, asked for staff comment. Um, being that my position here is still under a year, I was uh, proceeding under um, other noise exemption that had been that had been reviewed. Uh, this was similar in nature. I was aware there was conversations with the winery that mitigative measures were being uh, taken. Um, the idea that bylaw enforcement was able to provide a better presence to provide consistent response, uh, to provide a much uh, quicker response. Um, so those, those services that we're providing, um, I was able to explain to senior staff and uh, support my uh, proposal. Um, but I, I, I hope that from the beginning, I've been able to, to state that you know, I'm presenting a report based on the dates that I've received, uh, based on the previous ways that the Town of Lincoln has uh, received 
addressed and reviewed a noise exemption. Um, I would only reiterate my position back from committee's meeting is that I am available for, um, like the approval is to approve, amend, or deny. So there are ways that we can come up with a, an alternative possible. I didn't think that I was close to that, but I can only speak to my department's plan to be there to respond and to mitigate. Um, I believe these four measures are very clear that the wet Redstone Winery has to provide phone numbers. It has to provide response to its residents that are complaining about the noise or have any concerns. Um, and the Redstone Winery will be accountable for actions such as costs and mitigative measures. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor uh, McMillan. Yes, just, just finally on this topic, Madam Mayor, they, I understand what the bylaw says, and, and I know we have the bylaw, but what's happened here is that this is going beyond the limitations of the bylaw. That's what an exemption means, that, that we have the bylaw, and the bylaw sets limitations. What they're saying now is, we don't want, that's, it's too restrictive, we don't want to live within the, the bylaw, what we're asking for is let's go beyond the bylaw. So it's going to be much, much later in the evening than the bylaw allows. That's what the exemption is all about. So it's not, it's not the bylaw as such, it's the exemption to the bylaw. Through you, Madam Mayor, uh, to Council. And that was part of my review uh, in putting the report forward was that when I was getting questions on what this noise exemption means for uh, location. So let's stick to the example, stick to Redstone Winery. What is this exemption doing? Our noise bylaw is a prohibition bylaw. It's a, no, it's a bylaw to prohibit noise. Therefore, someone has to apply for an exemption to not be prohibited. So if they want an hour extra, they have to apply for an exemption from the prohibition. And it's to committee and to council to then review that report and say, do we want that exemption to proceed or do we want it to proceed with different qualifications and do we want to have it approved based on some other factors besides these four? Um, yes, the, the bylaw states you can have no noise from construction on a Sunday. You can have no noise on any weekday after 9 p.m. You can have no noise any day that's heard within your home that's disruptive. Those are very blanket statements. Therefore, you have to apply for an exemption to get out of those blanket prohibitive statements. Does that assist you, yes, Councillor? Yeah. All right. Um, I have um, Councillor Pacharibe next. <laughs> Thanks, Your Worship. Yeah, just just through you, and I, I guess this is just to to the two councillors. Would you feel more at ease at, at taking a segmented approach? Like, are, are you got, are you are you more at e at ill at ease of doing all the twenty five or the extension of the time period for an hour? Just so I I can better understand where you guys are at. Councillor? Uh, through you to um, Councillor Pachariva. I think I'm just a little ill at ease with a, a number of 25 events. You know, I understand they, they want exemption because they want to go to 10 o'clock, and I understand that. It's the 25 that I feel a little uncomfortable with. Next year, is it going to be 30 or 35? Or, like, where's the limit? You know, that's a lot of events for the people that live around there. And I, you know, we had people here that night that had concerns, and I heard their concerns, and, and that's why I am, you know, participating in this discussion around it. Um, I think 25 is excessive. I think that's kind of what's bothering me. Thank you. Could we have a question? Do you, uh, do you have a, a response to... Uh, I, I agree with what the, the Councillor Timber said. I think it is excessive. I think the numbers are, are just right. uh, too, too many. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just, uh, I'm just going to weigh in the, on this a little bit. Um, and I kind of like the approach that Councillor Patrieva was referring to as a segmented approach. Perhaps there's a, a smaller number uh, that could be approved up front um, to monitor the, the behavior and see how, how it works with bylaw enforcement and, um, you know, see what that looks like, see how it occurs um, with the opportunity for them to come back for like a second half or whatever. 
um, part of the way through. I don't know if that makes it too messy or too difficult to plan, but perhaps to test the waters, it might be an option for them. Thank you very much, Councillor. I think at this time that we should um, ask for clarification from the CAO on the issue of the number of events. Um, I don't believe I've seen anything in any policy that limits um, the number of events. I don't believe that we're limiting the number of weddings. I don't believe that we have a number that we're operating here. Mr. CAO, can you help us with this? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I, I mean, I, I think you're correct. At the end of the day, council can choose to make up their own um, appropriation or their own you know, administration of the policy, but there's nothing in the policy either one way or the other that prohibits 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Um, you know, the other comment I would make relative to will the number grow, um, we are going to be reviewing our noise bylaw. Uh, it may, based on the consultation we hear, we may determine 9 o'clock is too early. Uh, we may determine 9 o'clock is too late. Uh, at the end of the day, if that time uh, increases to 10, then in this particular case, because it's only a one hour extension from 9 o'clock, they would face no issue. We don't know at the end of the day whether um, the review of the bylaw uh, will, will lessen the restrictions or lessen the issues here or make them, you know, exacerbate them. But I think to answer your specific question relative to a, a, a phased approach, uh, there's nothing, I think, um, you know, within the bylaw, it doesn't limit occurrences. That would be something council would be putting forward. Uh, how, if we're challenged, we, we defend that, I don't know. Uh, I know Mr. Bruder is uh, nodding his head, saying there is no limit of, of occurrences in the bylaw. Uh, we'd probably have to be consulting with, um, with Redstone, determine when we're bringing it back, knowing we don't have a planning meeting uh, in, uh, in August. At the end of the day, though, I don't say that to make it more cumbersome for council. Should council direct us to go down a path in terms of limiting occurrences, uh, then we will attempt to uh, we will attempt to figure out what that particularly looks like. I mean, I can tell you, and you can ask the staff that are sitting in the back row, uh, from an economic development perspective, uh, it also sends a message. So I understand the balance uh, that we're looking to take here. Uh, I just don't know what better advice to give you in terms of. Um, the limitation number uh, and what, what number would you come in at? Councillor Thompson and then Councillor uh, McMillan. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Through you to, oh, I don't know, maybe the CAO or Mr. Collings. Um, with regards to the, the, the actual um, exemption from the bylaw, uh, if these, if, if things do not work appropriately, um, what is our, our tact in with regards to um, removing that exemption from the bylaw if things were not to go um, forward properly? Go ahead. Yeah. Through you, Madam Chairman, I, why don't I start and let Chris jump in on this particular issue? I think there's always the ability for us to uh, withdraw approvals. I, th I think the challenge becomes in the administration of what is noise and the, the adjudication, so to speak, of what is noise. Uh, and I think any sort of noise, whether amplified or not, can be called in as a complaint if it bothers someone. And that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the morning um, as, it, as it relates to this particular issue. That said, it really is the bylaw team's interpretation when they get to the site of whether they deem the noise to be excessive. And so I think at the end of the day, there's always grounds by which we can rescind those approvals uh, and we can do that uh, and reconsider any of the approvals that we've given. I think it then comes down to um, a, an assessment that our staff are doing when on site. And I think therein lies some of the challenges with this. It's not necessarily a specific uh, uh, science. Uh, there is an art to it, uh, and I think, as you heard, uh, Mr. Collings and his staff say at the last uh, at the last concert that was had, they deemed the noise minimal. I can tell you by looking at uh, both Chris and Jeffrey, uh, who spoke to me after, who I could tell by their responses, they didn't see it as minimal. Uh, it really is a reflection on what the individual sees as as not. Uh, appropriate levels of noise and so you're coming down to then having our bylaw officer to adjudicate or to you know determine what is excessive noise and so I think you know to go back to the first comment I made to answer your question we can absolutely rescind those permissions at any point in time should they become excessive. Councillor? 
All right, um, Councillor McMillan. I was just going to say that this is the proposal. I think we should just vote on this proposal rather than, than trying to go down the road to make amendments or changes or whatever at this point. This is the proposal. Let's vote on this proposal. Are you calling the question, Councillor? Calling the question. All right, thank you. I have a motion moved by... <clears throat> Whose signature is it? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Thompson, and seconded by Councillor Pachariva, that the noise bylaw exemption application 2017-02 by Redstone Winery be approved subject to the following conditions. Number um, A, um, that the event organizers shall notify all neighboring property owners within 500 meters of the entire property boundary in writing, a minimum of 10 days in advance of the start date of the event. A copy of the written notice shall be provided to the town. B, that the above notification shall provide the neighboring property owners with a direct telephone number to call during the event should the neighbors experience any noise complaints. C, that the event organizers shall respond to and take appropriate corrective action to any noise complaints to minimize any disturbances from the event. And D, if the town is required to respond to any noise complaints, the event organizer will be responsible for payment of the town's noise complaint inspection fee. Any questions? Councillor Patrick, or Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a point of clarification on the uh, notice, and I believe with the with the number of events were uh, that are being asked for, it it was one notice that was going out with all of the dates of the uh, events for the for the entire summer. I don't think they're looking to send a weekly notice of the next weeks. Uh, events. So just a point of clarification there. And, and just a, just a comment here, you know, I, I really struggle with um, council setting the number of events of anything. I, I just, I just really have a tough time with that. I, I absolutely support uh, enforcing the bylaw and making sure that the bylaw is, is being lived with and abided by, but I think we walk down a very dangerous road if we're starting to dictate how many events a, a business can have. It happens all over town. You know, we're seeing all kinds of uh, businesses have music Friday night, Saturday night. You, you head out down to Jordan, there's music Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. So I think we've got to be careful in telling a business when they can have events. Just just my thoughts. All right, thank you very much, Councillor. And um, now I'm just having to check with the clerk here because the question Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Councillor McPherson. Your pleasure on the motion. Those in favor? I'm sorry, just keep your hands up. Thompson, one, two, three, four. And those opposed? The motion is carried. Now, I think, uh, Mr. Bruder, that um, you've committed now, uh, not once, but twice, to ensuring that um, your department is um, going to be available to um, to monitor this, these, all of the situations across the town, not just this one, but all of them. And um, and I guess my only comment would be that whatever we do, it needs to be defensible, and um, and so we go forward. Thank you very much. Can no, thank you. All right, now Councillor Thompson has left the room. We are moving with the rest of the, of the minutes. 
And um, I have a motion moved by Councillor McPherson. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Collings. Moved by Councillor McPherson, seconded by Councillor Rinchima, that the minutes of the Planning Committee meeting of June 12, 2017, including the confidential addendum thereto be adopted and the recommendations contained therein be approved and acted upon. And Councillor McPherson, as the Vice Chair, are you reporting yes, on I this? Am. Thank yes, you I very am. much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and these are, these are highlights. We had a very, very lengthy e um, evening. Um, so full, full details regarding the motions uh, can be found in the minutes of the planning committee uh, that was held on June 12th. Uh, committee members uh, held public uh, hearings respecting two zoning bylaw amendment applications and a road closing application. Committee later recommended that staff uh, prepare committee reports respecting a zoning bylaw amendment application 142431 Ontario Limited and a road closing application east of the road Vineyards Inc. Once all comments have been received and, and issues addressed. Committee also recommended that a zoning bylaw amendment application in the name of Ted Orsprung be approved subject two conditions. Committee approved the ex execution of a development agreement for consent application at the southeast corner of the intersection of 19th Street and St. John's Drive in Jordan, subject to final review of the development agreement by the town solicitor. A facade improvement grant agreement between the town and Gordon and Margaret Thompson. Uh, subdivision agreement for the Lincoln Heights subdivision with 1528149 Ontario Inc. subject to conditions. Uh, bylaw to authorize the execution of a subdivision agreement for the Wilhelmus Landing subdivision with Herndon Homes Limited subject to conditions. And road closing and conveyance application subject to conditions. The committee also authorized the, the Director of Finance to reduce the letter of credit held by the town with respect to Maple Crest development phases 1, 2A, and 2B. Full details, are, uh, full details are with respect to reduction amounts are contained within the committee uh, minutes. And then uh, correspondence minutes and information items were received regarding the town of uh, Lakeshore with regards to a resolution requesting that the, the uh, province of Ontario ease restrictions of surplus dwelling sur severances in agriculturally zoned areas. Uh, also the MPCA with regards to a draft policy review for public consultation. Uh, and the Town of Lincoln's request for the region to participate in its new CIP incentives program. And finally we received uh, minutes from the Ag Active Transportation Committee meeting held on May 25th. And I would just like to thank uh, our legislative coordinator, Lisa McManus, for putting these very brief, uh, succinct uh, highlights together. <clears throat> Councillors, are there any questions to the minutes of the Planning Committee? There being none, your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Our next report is Infrastructure Committee minutes of June 14th, and I have a motion moved by Councillor Brunet, seconded by Councillor Timmers, that the minutes of the Infrastructure Committee meeting of June 14th, 2017 be adopted, and the recommendations contained therein be approved and acted upon. Councillor Brunet. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll try to keep it as fairly concise as I can, but we had uh, three major reports that evening. All committee members were in attendance except uh, Councillor Patrick was a little under the weather and he was filled in uh, by Councillor Foster on his, uh, on his behalf. Uh, there were no delegations, no correspondence, and like I mentioned, we had three reports. The first report was PW17-13, which was an emergency flooding update. A little background on that. Um, the purpose of this report was to uh, provide committee with an update on the emergency flooding that the town ex had experienced from significant storm events that occurred during the end of April into, into May. Uh, we had a lot of flash flooding as well as the fact that Lake Ontario is up uh, between four and a half and five feet. So this report provided information on next steps 
uh, to follow up with the emergency that includes road maintenance, stability, shoreline protection, mitigation, infrastructure financial impacts, and potential funding opportunities. So, uh, Chair, um, uh, sorry, Director of Public uh, Works, uh, Mr. Graham, uh, provided us with an overview and a PowerPoint presentation that evening uh, that showed some, some descriptive uh, slides uh, to talk about the weather conditions and what that had done to uh, road washouts along uh, the lakeshore, uh, shoreline erosion at Charles Daly Park, and then localized uh, basement flooding that had taken place in the Jordan and Camden areas. Uh, so the Director of Public Works walked us through a summary uh, that evening about uh, challenges that we're facing in terms of where the money's gonna come from, uh, short-term, long-term, um, and intermediate steps on, uh, on how we look forward to these, to these issues moving forward. Uh, temporary emergency repairs that were implemented, obviously, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that all those residents that were impacted uh, were dealt with in a safe um, uh, fashion. We made, uh, we made them, it was a voluntary um, evacuation. Anyone that didn't feel safe along the lakeshore, um, we made uh, arrangements for them to be, uh, to be housed alternatively. Um, so that was first and foremost that we, we made sure that our residents were safe. Um, so moving forward, uh, the disaster relief funding opportunities uh, are available and staff is gonna look at that and next steps. Um, so after the presentation uh, through Director Graham, we, uh, we had a number of discussions uh, at the committee level about you know, um, how we need to look at this. Uh, obviously we have unbudgeted costs associated to this emergency event. Uh, we have issues with residents that are potentially maybe doing things on property, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna engage in an inflow infiltration study uh, to increase public awareness uh, with regards to connecting possibly with, with sump pumps or rooftop uh, drainage into our municipal sewers. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about the role of the region of Niagara. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when our delegation was here, we talked about collaborative measure, measures with the Ministry of the Environment and the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Uh, the mayor brought up a, a number of things with regards to uh, opportunities under the Drainage Act uh, to address farm drainage and erosion issues as we move forward. Uh, so it was a lot of discussion there and, uh, and that report was, uh, was received for information. Our next report that evening was PW 17-14, uh, which was the 13th Street Road Closure Study Update. Uh, again, just a little bit of background and summary. Um, we had a washout uh, in that area back in, uh, I believe it was July of 2014. It was a flash flood which caused erosion and uh, caused us to... Uh, um, to close uh, that section of 13th uh, Street located between 4th Avenue and Horton Avenue. So that, that street has been closed for the last three years. So the Director of Public Works provided us with an overview of that report and uh, gave us detailed information and background into that closure study and what options are available um, to Council to decide whether we instate or permanently close that road. Um, so we had some very good dialogue about that. We talked about the summary of the public comments that we had received through a PIC. Uh, we talked about the costs that would be incurred um, to close the road and obviously conversely the cost to uh, the estimate to, to reopen the road. The impacting obviously of the, ne the uh, residents in that community who have, who have really had to change their, uh, their patterns over the last three years and how it's affected them. Um, and opportunities that we could use. Um, there was discussion that evening about trying to think outside the box and, and other ways that we could maybe look at uh, the repair, um, you know, such as a fiberglass uh, bridge and the need for uh, this council to consider possibly, um, you know, the project as part of our uh, deliberations as we move forward and look at our 10 year plan. So we had a lot of discussion that night. We went back and forth. Um, so we had a couple of motions. The first motion was that we, re we received the report um, uh, as information. And then we had a motion that was moved by uh, um, Mayor Easton and seconded by Council Councilor McPherson uh, that in relation, relation to the 13th Street, Street Road, uh, that the committee recommend to Council that the Town of Lincoln take necessary design and construction steps to keep it permanently open. And that staff be directed to include costs in the 10 year capital plan. And uh, we had great dialogue, we went back and forth and, uh, and that motion uh, was carried. And our final report that evening was uh, PW 17-15, Academy Street uh, Road Reconstruction. Um, council will remember that um, uh, we, uh, we have made uh, Academy Street a one way 
and uh, we had some money in there for ut uh, utility installations. Um, some of those costs um, have been changing, so we needed to uh, to look at uh, allocation to commit um, additional funds for uh, utility relocations, and we had some discussion on that, and there was a motion brought forward, and that motion was carried that council uh, commit to allocate additional funds uh, for utility relocations as outlined in that report. Uh, we had considerable inquiries that evening, just uh, very briefly, some of the uh, councillor inquiries that were brought forward. Um, I believe it was Councillor McMillan uh, raised a question. Uh, now that uh, Mountain Street and Beamsville is completed, uh, there was discussion that um, at the Mountain Street and Beam Street Road reconstruction project, we were gonna put in some, uh, uh, some bollards, some protective bollards adjacent to the old uh, town hall, the old Clinton town hall. So we had some discussion and an update uh, from that and the staff will follow up with the region. Um, we had some discussion with regards to the Jordan Area Improvement Environmental Assessment and how that's coming along and uh, uh, staff um, came back and gave us some information that there is additional consultation that's being taken place with uh, some First Nation groups. We had some considerable discussion with that and members requested that staff um, keep, keep us informed on those provincial and regional policies that are related to the First Nations consultation um, as, as it affects um, our development of pro, uh, procedures and our proposals as we, as we look forward to those uh, coming up forward. Um, had a number of discussions about um, uh, some, some concerns and some residents' um, concerns with regards to the grass cutting. Uh, we heard that at the Ward 2 meeting uh, with regards to uh, a ticks on some of our, um, our soccer fields and our, our parks, so we had some discussion about that and I believe um, we've asked our CAO to, uh, to get engaged in that. We had some discussion about the South Service Road and the resurfacing um, program uh, that's taking place um, all along Vineland, Beamsville, and into Grimsby, um, and, and how that relates to, to the region, and we asked for a little bit of update on that, when we can expect some completion on that. And, um, and the, I believe the mayor uh, raised a point with regards to uh, Frost Road, uh, bridge that's been closed for a number of years, over a decade, and looking at, uh, at, at uh, the new Active Transportation Committee to investigate opportunities uh, to provide uh, pedestrian access through that area. Um, announcements pretty well, we talked about uh, all the good things that are happening in our downtown core with regards to beautification and the new areas that have just been uh, um, formed and poured in front of the no frills and in front of the LCBO. And uh, we adjourned at 910. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. <clears throat> Any questions? Councillor Pacheria. Yeah. Um, thank you, Worship. Through you to uh, Councillor Brunet. I'm just curious, and, and because we had talked during the day, I don't know, maybe it wasn't it captured in the council inquiries, but did the, um, uh, in, in, in preparation to our ward meeting, we got some um, emails on, um, not emails, but some comments on Facebook about the speeding on Hickson and George Street and, you know, the stepping up of a, of a NRP patrol in the morning, especially when kids are getting on the school bus, there was um, an incident of a, I can't remember the color of the car, but shooting, you know, going around the corner on two wheels and going at an excessive rate of speed and shooting through three stop signs. Um, and then also to, um, because there were, and, 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 and on this feed, you know, a school bus driver had commented that yes, this is a regular occurrence, that this happens. And um, I had said to them that we would investigate um, the potential placement of the um, temporary speed bumps on Hickson and George Street to maybe address these problems because we had talked about that going in around the Serena Drive neighborhood. So as these other areas are addressed, then hopefully we can look at that. Thank you very much. Councillor Timmers. All right, maybe I overstepped there. Um, just want just to a moment, I'm just going to, sorry, uh, I didn't, apologies. I'm sorry, I didn't see but I think you had a response, Councillor, so I'm going to let you go forward. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, through you uh, to Councillor Patrick. So if the question is specifically at infrastructure, did we discuss that, uh, the answer would be no, uh, but certainly at the ward meeting, and I would defer 
to our director of public works because certainly we had um, we engaged with a couple people at the ward meeting who brought that subject up and uh, director graham was front and center and uh, is certainly aware of the situation there with regards to um, traffic and uh, problems that are occurring in on the george street area so i would defer um, through to director graham to maybe comment please director uh, graham uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, I've had conversations with the Niagara Regional Police and they're going to, if they're not out there uh, this week, they will be as soon as possible with uh, increased enforcement on uh, George Street and the Hickson Street area, especially given the, the, the uh, school crosswalk. So they're totally supporting that. And we're also looking at what other options we can do for traffic calming, some line painting uh, ideas. So we're, we're definitely pursuing it. Thank you very much. And Councillor Chimmers, you weren't overstepping. I, I'm sorry, I failed to see um, uh, Councillor Brunet's anxiety to speak. <laughs> My apologies. I wasn't sure where we were going because I, I was just focused on the minutes. So um, I, I just wanted a uh, clarification on the grading and drainage issues near 3930 Victoria Avenue, maybe through you to uh, Mr. Graham, if you could just uh, clarify what that issue is. So I'm not aware. Uh, through Madam Mayor, it's a it's um, a lot grading issue uh, on Victoria Avenue, just north of King Street in that area that we're going to be investigating further for some uh, drainage. There's some drainage problems there, so we're going to look at to that in more detail. Thank you. I, I just saw it in the minutes. I wasn't sure what it was referring to. Okay, thank you very much. All right, councillors, anyone else? <clears throat> Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. <clears throat> I have a motion moved by Councillor McFear, uh, sorry, Councillor Pachariva, seconded by, no, that's not correct. I cannot read your signatures tonight. I have a motion moved by Councillor Pachariva. I think I'm going to expect the printing. Seconded by Councillor Njima, that Council has considered the requirements of paragraph 17 of section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, and concludes that no further notice of public meeting is required in the matter of the following proposed amendments to bylaw, zoning bylaw number 93-14-Z1. Number 2017-452-Z493 to amend zoning bylaw number 93-14-Z1 as amended 1650607 on date 1650607 Inc. Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. A motion moved by Councillor Timmers and seconded by Councillor Brunet that leave be given to introduce the following bylaws. A, number 2017-50, to authorize the facade improvement grant agreement, Gordon and Margaret Thompson. B, number 2017-51, to authorize a development agreement, agreement Larry Bilkstow, Jason Bilkstow, and Carol Ann Murray. Number 2017-52-Z493 to amend zoning bylaw number 93-14-Z1 as amended 1650607 Ontario Inc. Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. A motion moved by Councillor Brunet and seconded by Councillor Timmers that bylaws number 2017-50, 2017-51, and 2017-52Z493 read a first time and be now read a second time, a second and third time and finally passed and that the mayor and clerk sign and seal the said bylaws. Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> Councillor inquiries. I have one from Councillor Thompson. Councillor Thompson, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just through to you to uh, Chief Hudson. Um, in light of the uh, truck incident on the, the QEW there in St. Catharines last week, just wondering how uh, our team in Lincoln here for our emergency services will be engaging the uh, EMS services of the Niagara region um, in regards to the debriefing of sort of their touchdowns and fumbles when it comes to that situation um, and how we can kind of learn from that. Um, certainly, I wonder if the chief could enlighten us on that perhaps. All right. Um it's a fairly complicated question. Chief, are you prepared to answer that this evening? I can answer in just uh, very general terms at this point. Okay. Uh, if I may, Madam Mayor, uh, through you to the, uh, the councillor. Um, like any major incident, uh, it's commonplace to have a, uh, a debriefing afterwards, and uh, I would expect that this would be the case as well. There's a number of regional entities involved in that incident. As well, we do have a, a regional group consisting of all area municipalities as well as the region, all the uh, community emergency management coordinators. So this is certainly a topic of discussion at an upcoming meeting, and uh, if anything um, evolves from the meeting in terms of opportunities for improvement or, or that kind of thing, I'll uh, certainly be sure to pass along through an information report. And you'll bring that to us um, when that occurs, if, uh, if there's anything to report? Absolutely, I can bring in an information report uh, to committee. Thank you, thank you very much. Satisfactory, Excellent. Councillor? thank you so much. And I have uh, Councillor Rangima and then uh, Councillor McPherson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So my inquiry uh, goes back to my um, report about the uh, liquid, uh, liquid nuclear waste that's gonna be trans transported uh, across Canada uh, by truck. So um, uh, I'm wondering maybe through the CAO, uh, when, what, what a committee or a when would be appropriate to discuss um, how, uh, what our role perhaps in commenting on that would be and how, similar to Councillor Thompson's inquiry, uh, what our, how we are in terms of emergency preparedness. Mr. CEO. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I mean, I think if council sees it fit that we may want to marry uh, the two requests from the two councillors uh, and bring back a more fulsome report, we can determine uh, what committee is appropriate. I think it's probably a topic for a committee of the whole because uh, it is an important topic in terms of uh, safety. I can tell you from an emergency management perspective, I have the utmost confidence that we're prepared to an emergency strike right now, but I think um, giving both the community and council a fulsome indication of what our emergency management plans are, uh, as well as how we would address uh, a particular issue like was experienced last week would be ideal and uh, SMT can have that conversation tomorrow, uh, or sorry, on Wednesday and uh, work with clerks to determine the appropriate meeting to come back with that. Satisfactory, Councillor? Uh, thank you, yes, uh, I'm, I guess another one of my questions is, do we have, are we, are we prepared to p take a position on that? Is that something we should be doing at the municipal level? Have, have other municipalities commented on, on that? I know that the region took a position on that. Uh, so that, um, is that something we can also discuss at the same time or should we dis discuss that at a different committee through to the CAO? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I think it's absolutely something that can be uh, incorporated into that report. I know that the Chief uh, did follow up with the Office of the Fire Art Marshal and Emergency Management, as well as other ministries, uh, including MTO, uh, and specifically the Emergency Management section, uh, in order to have this conversation on highly ra radioactive materials. So I think it's something that we can, um, you know, we can come back to you on. Uh, I know the Chief's also using an Ask Rail app that allows uh, them to determine various elements in, in real time. Uh, so there are a number of things that we're doing and a number of things that the emergency management uh, officials are doing uh, throughout the province that uh, I will ask the Chief uh, to speak to and, and report on when we come back to the appropriate committee. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you. And Councillor McPherson? 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, question through you to the CAO. Uh, is there any update on the status of the Phelps property on Regional Road 81 um, now into June and, and not seeing a lot of activity there? And just wondering if we have information uh, around a timeline to completion of the archaeological dig or, or what is what is happening there? I'm getting a lot of questions from from neighbors and and residents of uh, of the uh, property beside that property. Mr. CAO. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think the most up-to-date update that I have for you is that uh, we continue uh, to meet with Phelps. Uh, they have. Um, I mean, there's certain elements we can probably speak to publicly and certain elements that maybe I'll come back to you and speak at, speak to you in camera. I can tell you that we are working uh, with the province, with Phelps and ourselves in order to address some of the uh, issues regarding um, the indigenous elements uh, that are going on in that particular property, still looking for a solution uh, in order to address that. Um, there are some limitations on the property as a result of what was found uh, that make it slightly more difficult uh, than initially anticipated, and so uh, Phelps uh, still remains committed to moving forward with the project, uh, but there's some issues that need to be addressed. Councillor, I think your question is quite timely, and in light of the request that was made at the Planning Committee meeting, uh, certainly a better understanding for Council members would be appropriate, um, and that would um, help us in the future to um, to understand um, what parts, there are parts to the discussion that are not to be made public. That's not our rule, that's an external rule, or an external, ex I would say it's a rule. It's not something that we are setting out um, uh, to keep information from, pe um, from people. We're not permitted uh, as part of those discussions to reveal information. Councillor McMillan. Did I see your hand? Uh, Councillor Brunet. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you um, to the CEO, I was wondering if uh, our CEO could update us. We, we've had, had a number of uh, discussions over the last two or three weeks, a lot of inquiries that I've been uh, forwarding uh, to the CEO, but I, I think uh, as we're on Kojiko tonight, I think we owe it to the residents to, to update them to, as a municipality on what we're doing, and that's specifically the questions we're, we've been having about um, uh, it, it's it's kind of two or three fold. So uh, roadside mowing, so people that are complaining about, about grass on the side of the road in their properties that hasn't been cut, uh, certainly I know Director Graham has addressed that in terms of we've had some weather issues in April and May and we're getting caught up on that, so I appreciate that comment. But uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, at the ward meeting we heard a number of people talking about our parks and what we're doing in terms of um, uh, keeping up to that, and I, I know um, the CAO had, had indicated that uh, our Director of Public Works and our Director of SRC were involved, and I believe we were maybe reaching out to the public health to help us with some of these particular issues surrounding uh, these discussions. So I was wondering if uh, our CAO could update us on where we stand on some of those regards. Mr. Um, or Councillor Brunet, um, at the committee, at Infrastructure Committee, you will recall that Mr. Graham spoke to us about not being able to go into the parks because of the damage that was anticipated from uh, the mowers, et cetera, because of the dampness, as well as the timing issue around being able to access certain properties, as well as to keep up since we don't have discrete staff for each, uh, each uh, sub-department. So is your question beyond that? Uh, my question is with regards to the, the comments that I've been getting that I've been passing on to the CEO. So in areas like Durham Road where we have, um, we have businesses that are uh, promoting um, their employees to get out and walk during uh, lunch breaks and coffee breaks and in the fact that we're promoting active transportation in the municipality, uh, we've got residents that are concerned about the fact that grass isn't being cut, it, cut and people are walking and picking up ticks. So I've asked the CAO to comment on where we stand. He had indicated to me that he was reaching out 
to the regional uh, public health department to see if we get some support in that area. So that really, um, through you, Madam Mayor, is my question. Very good, thank you very much. Mr. CAO? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'll try to address uh, the multiple pieces of uh, Councillor Bernays' questions as we have been in fairly regular contact over the last uh, number of days. Uh, let me begin by the roadside uh, mowing program. I think Director Graham did address that at Infrastructure Committee uh, and he said while we're slightly late due to the weather, uh, we are making up grounds on that particular element. I think it's the same conversation that I've been having both with uh, Director Graham and Director Brigantino relative to our parks. As you recall, our parks are both cut by our existing staff as well as uh, a particular uh, contract service that we have. We are meeting with the contract service this week to ensure that grass is, is being cut at the appropriate um, levels and at the appropriate service levels that we uh, require. I think it's also a unique set of uh, circumstances this year uh, and that relates specifically to an incredibly wet spring uh, and then uh, as we head into summer in a few days we've had immense heat uh, that has also re you know uh, resulted in uh, that growth I think exceeding what anyone uh, thought it would be uh, and again a delay in terms of our program um, the councillor is correct I have reached out to Dr. Herji who's the associate medical officer of health uh, and within his portfolio is the uh, tick and tick deterrent strategy element of uh, the Niagara Region's Public Health Services uh, and requested uh, both from him and Director Tripp anything that they can do uh, to assist us as it relates to roadways, uh, long grasses, uh, as well as parks. Some of it will be a, a much more broad-based communication strategy that we'll be able to employ with our staff and regional staff. Some of it will be if there's anything that we can do uh, in terms of any sort of physical application uh, that we may be able to take uh, in those particular areas where we're noticing a lot of uh, walking or a lot of uh, manual uh, efforts being taken. So uh, those are the updates I have on this. I don't know if Director Graham has anything to add further. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Just on in terms of the roadside mowing program, um, we're more than happy to make certain roads a, a, a higher priority if we know if there's certain areas where there's more walking activity than other roads. So we're going to be looking at our, our program and, and making those types of areas a higher priority to be mowed sooner than some other roads. So in terms of Durham Road, uh, we are going to make that a priority to get it mowed given um, it's been brought to our attention quite a a lot of people walk along that road. So we'll, we're gonna modify our program to be able to recognize that. All right, um, uh, Councillor Brunet. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate those comments. I, I think, I just think it's important that we, you know, we communicate back that, uh, that we're, you know, we are understanding, um, you know, the residents' concerns and that we are doing something. Uh, just, just as an aside, again, I don't want to uh, get up on a soapbox here, but when you, when you drive around the municipality, you, you see certain things. So I, I see our bylaw officer I maybe has, has exited the meeting, but um, I, I think another point um, that, that I noticed over the last week is we have, we have properties that, um, that are, aren't being maintained, properties that, uh, you know, that are for sale. There's a property right on, right on uh, Regional Road 81 across from Hillview, uh, the Benevolent, and that lot uh, has, a for, has a for sale sign on, obvious by the property owner. The for sale sign, if you go there tomorrow morning, you will not be able to see it because the grass around the sign is about three feet high. Um, it's right along sidewalk, people walking all from Hillview over to Lincoln Avenue, walking on that sidewalk, and the grass is three feet high. So again, uh, I think, um, you know, we have a uh, responsibility to look at that from a bylaw office enforcement as well. Um, so um, maybe if the CAO could uh, communicate that through, it uh, would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. CAO? Through you, Madam Mayor, I duly noted and we'll be sharing with our staff, uh, and I see Dave nodding as well. Councillor Pacioriba. Yeah, through you, Your Worship, and it was on the same lines of Councillor Brunet's inquiry. I mean, there's a number of properties throughout the town that are chronic offenders of this. And given the prevalence of, of the infestation of ticks, no longer is a simple, you know, one foot cutting around the property's edge acceptable in any way, shape, or form. So now that we have a full complement of bylaw enforcement officers, and I wish Mr. Collings would still be here, we need to get out and we need to address this. A lot of these are our gateway to our municipality. And, you know, um, they need to be kept in a certain standard. We've set that standard. 
And whether it be grass cuttings or buildings, I know a bunch of us received a presentation over the weekend, like we've got to, we've got to look at this. And, and you know, because we're, we're working with the region to increase beautification, but that's only one aspect. Councillors, I would just comment that um, it is true that we do have a standard. However, within the last two years, we have enhanced the standard by setting expectations at this table, verbally and otherwise. Uh, we may not have backed, up, uh, backed that up with the staff to support the enhanced standard. In fact, I know that we have not. Uh, we still have uh, staff that overlap into a number of different uh, jobs. Um, and so all these things do need to be taken into account when we're, when we're um, discussing this. However, I think the CEO has well heard what, uh, what you've said tonight and uh, he'll be coming back probably through infrastructure, Mr. Chairman, um, so that we know what will happen, be happening in the future. But I'm suggesting that we may also have to consider in next year's budget, if we're going to have that standard, a different, uh, a different staffing pattern. All right, um, let's move on now to announcement, oh, the notice of motion, yes. Any notice of motion? Nothing? All right, any, any announcements? Mr. CAO, please. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'll tr try to make it brief. I, I did want to summarize for Council, uh, as a result of uh, our full complement within corporate and legislative services and the addition of, of Lisa McManus, uh, we've been having uh, a lot more conversations within that corporate services team in terms of uh, how we're providing more uh, support for Council, uh, more support for those committees, all things that we had committed to doing uh, as part of that particular uh, business case that we brought forward. Uh, one of the most recent meetings was with the mayor uh, and we had a very thorough conversation in terms of the Municipal Act and uh, in order to keep more in line with that, how we're gonna try to um, do some things to streamline our minutes, to support our chairs, uh, to allow meetings to flow a little bit more. Um, a little bit more easily, things around pre-meetings, our agenda reviews, which we've started and, and are formalizing, uh, and, and some additions like that. Some of the things that um, uh, that we discuss doing, and again, that's to be more in line with the Municipal Act and to still allow for councillors to inform the public, uh, specifically is around uh, the way we capture uh, the ca we capture minutes um, and things that are not necessarily mandated within the Municipal Act, so councillors' reports and announcements. Oftentimes those are captured in great detail uh, in the minutes. Uh, what we're gonna do in order to avoid and reduce, I think, some of the minor errors, minor errors uh, that we're often finding because we're trying to catch some of that uh, is try to limit, I think, the level of detail we have in all of that. Again, not trying to omit councillors and members of council from doing it, but rather uh, trying to focus our time and our energy on supporting you in those pre-meetings and assisting you in terms of the chairing roles that each of you play. So uh, there is a stipulation within the Municipal Act that speaks to without note or comment. So again, what we're gonna try to do is capture, I think, the very cogent and important points that are required, uh, but not get into extensive levels of detail within the minutes as it relates to those pieces around councillor reports and, uh, and announcements. Not the particular minutes themselves. I think we've heard very loud and clear uh, from members of council the importance of having detail within the minutes that it relate to motions, uh, but we were talking about how do we streamline the process a little bit more. Um, inquiries uh, that, uh, that council brings up, if we're able to answer them, I think as we've always said, uh, they won't be captured in the minutes, but if they're things that need to be brought back, and I know Councillor Pacjareva highlighted um, you know, an outstanding business, li business list type format, uh, and that staff can follow up with council on those sorts of things. So if they're the one-offs that we can answer, uh, we'll answer them for you at committee, but if they're things that, uh, that require uh, more follow-up, those are the things that we'll try to capture in the minutes. Uh, it does allow us to take those questions and then permit the public to have an opportunity to be part of that discussion and to hear that discussion and to, for it to be advertised on the agenda uh, in a much more transparent approach. Uh, and we'll be combining our public hearing minutes with our planning committee minutes as they're part of the same planning committee structure. So nothing major there. We can send you that uh, in written correspondence. Uh, and should council have any concerns or any issues with that, then uh, we can definitely uh, look to address uh, those concerns 
uh, and uh, change anything that we're uh, recommending in terms of streamlining the process. Any questions at all? Um, I want, to, I, it's my desire to have the, um, my report uh, included with the minutes and so um, uh, the Legislative Services has advised me that the way to do that is to submit it, the report, which I do um, um, prior to the council meeting anyway. Um, and I would advise uh, you to do the same because you do have some very important information and you're, you, you're all working from a, a report of one form, whether it's on your, on your um, um, devices or whether you've got it written out and I think it would be very important. And they are not included in the minutes, but they are attached to the minutes. Uh, so, um, that's uh, the more appropriate way way to uh, the way to do it. And as far as the questions are concerned, um, in order to ensure that um, the public are informed uh, about the discussion, uh, and since um, including all of that is not really um, adhering to the Municipal Act, again, if we ask the question, then the question will come in the form of a report and then everyone on council will hear what the answer to the question is. If we keep the question, the councillor inquiries to the committee meetings, then that, that methodology of responding to the questions then will be circulated to all members of council and we will all hear the answer. Otherwise, we're not aware of what questions, necessarily what questions are being asked. So, um, these are changes and we can certainly discuss them further. You may have some other thoughts after this evening. Um, however, um, these are some changes that are being made in order to ensure that our council processes fit with the Municipal Act to a greater extent while ensuring the public are informed about important matters within our community. There is no closed session this evening. I have a motion moved by Councillor Thompson and seconded by Councillor Timmers that leave be given to introduce the following bylaw, number 2017-53, to adopt, confirm, and ratify matters dealt with by council resolution. Your pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. I have a motion moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Timmers, that bylaw number 2017-53 read a first time, be now read a second and third time, and finally passed, and that the mayor and clerk sign and seal the said bylaw. The pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing us into your homes. And this meeting is adjourned. The business of the council as published and circulated having been completed.